Mysterium Coniunctionis, an inquiry into the separation and synthesis of psychic opposites in alchemy, by C. G. Jung, second edition, translated by R. F. C. Hull. Editorial note. Volume 14 of the Collected Works presents Jung's last great work, on which he was engaged for more than a decade, from 1941 to 1954. He finished it in his 80th year. As is to be expected from its culminating position in his writings and from its subject matter, the book gives a final account of his lengthy researches into alchemy. Jung's interest in the symbolical significance of alchemy for modern depth psychology first found expression, in 1929, in his commentary to The Secret of the Golden Flower. The theme was taken up again in his Eranos lectures of 1935 and 1936, which formed the basis of Psychology and Alchemy, originally published in 1944. Further researches led to the publication of essays now included in Alchemical Studies, Volume 13 of the Collected Works. A preliminary study of the special symbolism of the Coniunctio in relation to psychotherapeutic problems appeared in The Psychology of the Transference, 1946, while the connection between philosophical alchemy and Christianity was elaborated in Ion, 1951. All these themes are brought together in Mysterium Coniunctionis, where Jung continues his work of interpretation by examining in detail a number of texts taken from the alchemical classics. The scope of the book is indicated in its subtitle, An Inquiry into the Separation and Synthesis of Psychic Opposites in Alchemy. This process, summed up in the trenchant formula solve et coagula, dissolve and coagulate, underlies the opus alchemicum and may be symbolically understood as the process of psychic integration. The focus of the book is on the symbolism of the coniunctio and the preceding stages of dissociation. These are known in alchemy as the chaos or prima materia, and they lead via the intermediate stages to a resolution of the conflict of opposites in the production of the Lapis Philosophorum. Fresh evidence is brought to bear upon Jung's thesis that the Lapis is not only a parallel of the Christ figure, but a symbolical prefiguration of psychic totality, or the self. Jung's inquiry is of a highly advanced character and necessitates a wide knowledge of the concepts of analytical psychology in general and Jung's previous publications on alchemy in particular. The reader who follows Jung in his search for a deeper understanding of the opus alchemicum will not only discover in this book new and fascinating aspects of the history of the European mind, but will also be rewarded by fresh insights into such basic psychological problems as the structure of the self and the ego and their relation to one another, the nature of transference and countertransference, and the process of active imagination. In many ways, this book is the summing up of all Jung's later work. The English edition differs from the Swiss in the following particulars. It comprises volumes one and two of that version. Volume three is an edition and study by Marie-Louise von Franz of Aurora Consurgens, a 13th century treatise traditionally attributed to Thomas Aquinas and rediscovered by Jung, which has been issued in English as a companion volume to Mysterium Coniunctionis, but outside the collected works. The paragraph numbers of the present work do not correspond to those in the two Swiss volumes, which run in separate sequence. Further, many of the longer paragraphs have been broken up, and in certain instances, the material has been rearranged within the chapters to facilitate the exposition. The most important of these changes were made with the author's consent. In order not to overload the footnotes, the Latin and Greek passages have been put into an appendix. An asterisk in a footnote indicates that the quotation translated there or in the main text will be found in the appendix under the corresponding footnote number of the chapter in question. Two sections of This work were previously published. Chapter 2, Section 3, appeared as Das Rätsel von Bologna in Beidrag zur Festschrift Albert Ehry, Basel 1945, pp. 265-79, translated as The Bologna Enigma, Ambix, London 2, 1946, 1 and 8, 91. Chapter 3, Section 3 appeared as De Sulfur in Nova Acta Paracelsica, Einsiedeln, Fee, 1948, 27-40. For the second edition, numerous corrections and revisions have been made in cross-references to other volumes of the collected works now available, and likewise in the bibliography. 
The Jizamal to Work edition of the present work appeared in 1968 as, in effect, a reprint of the 1955-1956 Swiss edition, retaining its textual arrangement and paragraph numbering. In order to facilitate cross-reference between the English and German text, a table has been added to this edition, correlating the paragraph numbers see below, pp. 697 ff. One paragraph, 183 in vol. 2, p. 124 of the Gizamal to Worki edition, was inadvertently omitted in the first edition of the present volume. It should follow paragraph 518 on page 368 and is translated here as paragraph 508a. The reader must pardon my use of metaphors that are linguistically analogous to dogmatic expressions. If you have conceptions of things you can have no conceptions of, then the conception and the thing appear to coincide, nor can two different things you know nothing of be kept apart. I must therefore expressly emphasize that I do not go in for either metaphysics or theology, but am concerned with psychological facts on the borderline of the knowable. So if I make use of certain expressions that are reminiscent of the language of theology, this is due solely to the poverty of language, and not because I am of the opinion that the subject matter of theology is the same as that of psychology. Psychology is very definitely not a theology. It is a natural science that seeks to describe experienceable psychic phenomena. In doing so, it takes account of the way in which theology conceives and names them, because this hangs together with the phenomenology of the contents under discussion. But as empirical science, it has neither the capacity nor the competence to decide on questions of truth and value, this being the prerogative of theology. Translator's Note Standard translations of Latin and Greek texts have been used where they conformed more or less to the author's own versions, and they are referred to in the footnotes. Where such translations were unsuitable or non-existent, as is particularly the case with the texts in the appendix, an English version has been supplied by Mr. A. S. B. Glover. To him I would like to express my deepest thanks for his tireless help in preparing this book. My thanks are also due to Miss Barbara Hanna and Dr. Marie-Louise von Franz for reading through the typescript and making many valuable suggestions. Forward. This book, my last, was begun more than 10 years ago. I first got the idea of writing it from C. Kerenyi's essay on the Aegean festival in Goethe's Faust. The literary prototype of this festival is the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, itself a product of the traditional hieroscamo symbolism of alchemy. I felt tempted at the time to comment on Kareni's essay from the standpoint of alchemy and psychology, but soon discovered that the theme was far too extensive to be dealt with in a couple of pages. Although the work was soon underway, more than 10 years were to pass before I was able to collect and arrange all the material relevant to this central problem. As may be known, I showed in my book Psychology and Alchemy, first published in 1944, how certain archetypal motifs that are common in alchemy appear in the dreams of modern individuals who have no knowledge of alchemical literature. In that book, the wealth of ideas and symbols that lie hidden in the neglected treatises of this much misunderstood art was hinted at rather than described in the detail it deserved. For my primary aim was to demonstrate that the world of alchemical symbols definitely does not belong to the rubbish heap of the past, but stands in a very real and living relationship to our most recent discoveries concerning the psychology of the unconscious. Not only does this modern psychological discipline give us the key to the secrets of alchemy, but conversely, Alchemy provides the psychology of the unconscious with a meaningful historical basis. This was hardly a popular subject, and for that reason it remained largely misunderstood. Not only was alchemy almost entirely unknown as a branch of natural philosophy and as a religious movement, but most people were unfamiliar with the modern discovery of the archetypes, or had at least misunderstood them. Indeed, there were not a few who regarded them as sheer fantasy, although the well-known example of whole numbers, which also were discovered and not invented, might have taught them better, not to mention the patterns of behavior in biology. 
Just as numbers and instinctual forms do exist, so there are many other natural configurations or types which are exemplified by Levy Brule's representations collectives. They are not metaphysical speculations, but, as we would expect, symptoms of the uniformity of Homo sapiens. Today there is such a large and varied literature describing psychotherapeutic experiences and the psychology of the unconscious that everyone has had an opportunity to familiarize himself with the empirical findings and the prevailing theories about them. This is not true of alchemy, most accounts of which are vitiated by the erroneous assumption that it was merely the precursor of chemistry. Herbert Silberer was the first to try to penetrate its much more important psychological aspect, so far as his somewhat limited equipment allowed him to do so. Owing to the paucity of modern expositions and the comparative inaccessibility of the sources, it is difficult to form an adequate conception of the problems of philosophical alchemy. It is the aim of the present work to fill this gap. As is indicated by the very name which he chose for it, the Spagyric Art, or by the oft-repeated saying, solve et coagula, dissolve and coagulate, the alchemist saw the essence of his art in separation and analysis on the one hand, and synthesis and consolidation on the other. For him there was first of all an initial state in which opposite tendencies or forces were in conflict. Secondly, there was the great question of a procedure which would be capable of bringing the hostile elements and qualities, once they were separated, back to unity again. The initial state, named the chaos, was not given from the start, but had to be sought for as the prima materia, and just as the beginning of the work was not self-evident, so to an even greater degree was its end. There are countless speculations on the nature of the end state, all of them reflected in its designations. The commonest are the ideas of its permanence, prolongation of life, immortality, incorruptibility, its androgyny, its spirituality and corporeality, its human qualities and resemblance to man, homunculus, and its divinity. The obvious analogy in the psychic sphere to this problem of opposites is the dissociation of the personality brought about by the conflict of incompatible tendencies, resulting as a rule from an inharmonious disposition. The repression of one of the opposites leads only to a prolongation and extension of the conflict, in other words, to a neurosis. The therapist therefore confronts the opposites with one another and aims at uniting them permanently. The images of the goal which then appear in dreams often run parallel with the corresponding alchemical symbols. An instance of this is familiar to every analyst, the phenomenon of the transference, which corresponds to the motif of the chemical wedding. To avoid overloading this book, I devoted a special study to the psychology of the transference, using the alchemical parallels as a guiding thread. Similarly, the hints or representations of wholeness, or the self, which appear in the dreams also occur in alchemy as the numerous synonyms for the lapis philosophorum, which the alchemists equated with Christ. Because of its great importance, this last relationship gave rise to a special study, Ion. Further offshoots from the theme of this book are my treatises, The Philosophical Tree, Synchronicity, and a Causal Connecting Principle, an answer to job. The first and second parts of this work are devoted to the theme of the opposites and their union. The third part is an account of, and commentary on, an alchemical text, which, evidently written by a cleric, probably dates from the 13th century and discloses a highly peculiar state of mind in which Christianity and alchemy interpenetrate. The author tries, with the help of the mysticism of the Song of Songs, to fuse apparently heterogeneous ideas, partly Christian and partly derived from natural philosophy, in the form of a hymn-like incantation. This text is called Aurora Consurgens, also Aurea Hora, and traditionally it is ascribed to St. Thomas Aquinas. It is hardly necessary to remark that Thomist historians have always reckoned it, or wanted to reckon it, among the spurious and false writings, no doubt because of the traditional depreciation of alchemy. This negative evaluation of alchemy was due, in the main, to ignorance. People did not know what it meant to its adepts because it was commonly regarded as mere gold-making. I hope I have shown in my book Psychology and Alchemy that, properly understood, it was nothing of the sort. Alchemy meant a very great deal to people like Albertus Magnus and Roger Bacon, and also to St. Thomas Aquinas. 
We have not only the early testimony of Zosimos of Panopolis from the 3rd century, but that of Petrus Bonus of Ferrara from the beginning of the 14th century, which both point to the parallelism of the alchemical arcanum and the god-man. Aurora Consurgens tries to amalgamate the Christian and alchemical view, and I have therefore chosen it as an example of how the spirit of medieval Christianity came to terms with alchemical philosophy and as an illustration of the present account of the alchemical problem of opposites. Today, once again, we hear tendentious voices still contesting the hypothesis of the unconscious, declaring that it is nothing more than the personal prejudice of those who make use of this hypothesis. Remarkably enough, no consideration is given to the proofs that have been put forward. They are dismissed on the ground that all psychology is nothing more than a preconceived subjective opinion. It must be admitted that probably in no other field of work is there so great a danger of the investigator's falling a victim to his own subjective assumptions. He of all people must remain more than ever conscious of his personal equation. But, young as the psychology of unconscious processes may be, it has nevertheless succeeded in establishing certain facts which are gradually gaining general acceptance. One of these is the polaristic structure of the psyche, which it shares with all natural processes. Natural processes are phenomena of energy, constantly arising out of a less probable state of polar tension. This formula is of special significance for psychology because the conscious mind is usually reluctant to see or admit the polarity of its own background although it is precisely from there that it gets its energy. The psychologist has only just begun to feel his way into this structure, and it now appears that the alchemistical philosophers made the opposites and their union one of the chief objects of their work. In their writings, certainly, they employed a symbolical terminology that frequently reminds us of the language of dreams, concerned as these often are with the problem of opposites. Since conscious thinking strives for clarity and demands unequivocal decisions, it has constantly to free itself from counter-arguments and contrary tendencies, with the result that especially incompatible contents either remain totally unconscious or are habitually and assiduously overlooked. The more this is so, the more the unconscious will build up its counter-position. As the alchemists, with but few exceptions, did not know that they were bringing psychic structures to light, but thought that they were explaining the transformations of matter, there were no psychological considerations to prevent them, for reasons of sensitiveness from laying bare the background of the psyche, which a more conscious person would be nervous of doing. It is because of this that alchemy is of such absorbing interest to the psychologist. For this reason, too, it seemed necessary to my co-worker and myself to subject the alchemical conception of opposites and their union or reconciliation to a thoroughgoing investigation. However abstruse and strange the language and imagery of the alchemists may seem to the uninitiated, they become vivid and alive as soon as comparative research reveals the relationship of the symbols to processes in the unconscious. These may be the material of dreams, spontaneous fantasies, and delusional ideas on the one hand, and on the other hand, they can be observed in works of creative imagination and in the figurative language of religion. The heterogeneous material adduced for comparison may seem in the highest degree baffling to the academically educated reader who has met these items only in an impersonal context, historical, ethnic, or geographical, but who does not know their psychological affinities with analogous formations, themselves derived from the most varied sources. He will naturally be taken aback at first if certain symbols in ancient Egyptian texts are brought into intimate relationship with modern findings concerning the popular religion of India and at the same time with the dreams of an unsuspecting European. But what is difficult for the historian and philologist to swallow is no obstacle for the physician. His biological training has left him with far too strong an impression of the comparability of all human activities for him to make any particular to-do about the similarity, indeed the fundamental sameness, of human beings and their psychic manifestations. If he is a psychiatrist, he will not be astonished at the essential similarity of psychotic contents, whether they come from the Middle Ages or from the present, from Europe or from Australia, from India 
or from the Americas. The processes underlying them are instinctive, therefore universal and uncommonly conservative. The weaver bird builds his nest in his own peculiar fashion, no matter where he may be. And just as we have no grounds for assuming that he built his nest differently 3,000 years ago, so it is very improbable that he will alter his style in the next 3,000. Although contemporary man believes that he can change himself without limit or be changed through external influences, the astounding, or rather the terrifying, fact remains that despite civilization and Christian education, he is still, morally, as much in bondage to his instincts as an animal, and can therefore fall victim at any moment to the beast within. Chapter 1. The Components of the Konyunksho, One the Opposites the factors which come together in the Konyunksho are conceived as opposites, either confronting one another in enmity or attracting one another in love. To begin with, they form a dualism. For instance, the opposites are humidum, moist, sicum, dry, frigidum, cold, calidum, warm, superiora, upper, higher, inferiora, lower, spiritus anima, spirit soul, corpus body, colum, heaven, terra, earth, ignis, fire, aqua, water, bright, dark, Agents, active, patience, passive, volatile, volatile, gaseous, fixum, solid, pretiosum, precious, costly, also carum, dear, vile, cheap, common, bonum, good, malum, evil, manifestum, open, occultum, occult, also slatum, hidden, oriens, east, occidens, west, vivum, living, mortum, dead, inert, masculus, masculine, fomina, feminine, sol, luna. Often the polarity is arranged as a quaternio, quaternity, with the two opposites crossing one another, as for instance the four elements or the four qualities, moist, dry, cold, warm, or the four directions and seasons, thus producing the cross as an emblem of the four elements and symbol of the sublunary physical world. This fourfold physis, the cross, also appears in the signs for Earth, Venus, Mercury, Saturn, and Jupiter. The opposites and their symbols are so common in the texts that it is superfluous to cite evidence from the sources. On the other hand, in view of the ambiguity of the alchemist's language, which is tam ethish quam physis, as much ethical as physical, it is worthwhile to go rather more closely into the manner in which the texts treat of the opposites. Very often, the masculine-feminine opposition is personified as king and queen in the Rosarium Philosophorum also as emperor and empress, or as service, slave, or vir rubius, red man, and mulier candida, white woman. In the Visio Arislae, they appear as Gabricus, or Thabricius, and Bea, the king's son and daughter. Theriomorphic symbols are equally common and are often found in the illustrations. I would mention the eagle and toad, the eagle flying through the air and the toad crawling on the ground, which are the emblem of Avicenna in Michael Mayer, the eagle representing Luna, or Juno, Venus, Bea, who is fugitive and winged like the eagle, which flies up to the clouds and receives the rays of the sun in his eyes. The toad is the opposite of air, it is a contrary element, namely earth, whereon alone it moves by slow steps and does not trust itself to another element. Its head is very heavy and gazes at the earth. For this reason it denotes the philosophic earth, which cannot fly, i.e. cannot be sublimated, as it is firm and solid. Upon it as a foundation the golden house is to be built. Were it not for the earth in our work, the air would fly away, neither would the fire have its nourishment nor the water its vessel. Another favorite theriomorphic image is that of the two birds or two dragons, one of them winged, the other wingless. This allegory comes from an ancient text, De Chemia Senioris Antiquissimi Philosophi Libellus. The wingless bird or dragon prevents the other from flying. They stand for Saul and Luna, brother and sister, who are united by means of the art. In lamb spring symbols, they appear as the astrological fishes which, swimming in opposite directions, symbolize the spirit-soul polarity. The water they swim in is mare nostrum, our sea, and is interpreted as the body. The fishes are without bones and cortex. From them is produced a mare immensum, which is the aqua permanence, permanent water. Another symbol is the stag and unicorn meeting in the forest. The stag signifies the soul, the unicorn spirit, and the forest the body. The next two pictures in Lamb Spring's symbols show the lion and lioness, or the wolf and dog, the latter two fighting. They too symbolize soul and spirit. In figure seven, the opposites are symbolized by two birds in a wood, one fledged, the other unfledged. Whereas in the earlier pictures, the conflict seems to be between spirit and soul, 
the two birds signify the conflict between spirit and body, and in figure eight, the two birds fighting do in fact represent that conflict, as the caption shows. The opposition between spirit and soul is due to the latter having a very fine substance. It is more akin to the helical body and is denser et crassier, denser and grosser, than the spirit. The elevation of the human figure to a king or a divinity, and on the other hand, its representation in subhuman, theriomorphic form, are indications of the transconscious character of the pairs of opposites. They do not belong to the ego personality, but are supraordinate to it. The ego personality occupies an intermediate position, like the anima inter bona et mala sita, soul placed between good and evil. The pairs of opposites constitute the phenomenology of the paradoxical self man's totality. That is why their symbolism makes use of cosmic expressions like coelum, terra. The intensity of the conflict is expressed in symbols like fire and water, height and depth, life and death. 2. The Quaternio and the Mediating Role of Mercurius The arrangement of the opposites in a quaternity is shown in an interesting illustration in Stolzenberg's Viridarium Chimicum, Figs Twem which can also be found in the Philosophia Reformata of Milius, 1622 PU 17. The goddesses represent the four seasons of the sun in the circle of the zodiac, Aries, Cancer, Libra, Capricorn, and at the same time the four degrees of heating, as well as the four elements, combined around the circular table. The synthesis of the elements is affected by means of the circular movement in time, circulatio rota, of the sun through the houses of the zodiac. As I have shown elsewhere, the aim of the circulatio is the production, or rather, reproduction, of the original man who was a sphere. Perhaps I may mention in this connection a remarkable quotation from Ostanis in Abul Qasim, describing the intermediate position between two pairs of opposites constituting a quaternio. Ostanis said, Save me, O my God, for I stand between two exalted brilliancies known for their wickedness, and between two dim lights. Each of them has reached me, and I know not how to save myself from them. And it was said to me, Go up to Agatha Damon the Great and ask aid of him, and know that there is in thee somewhat of his nature, which will never be corrupted. And when I ascended into the air, he said to me, Take the child of the bird which is mixed with redness, and spread for the gold its bed which comes forth from the glass, and place it in its vessel, whence it has no power to come out except when thou desirest, and leave it until its moistness has departed. The quaternio in this case evidently consists of the two malefici, Mars and Saturn. Mars is the ruler of Aries, Saturn of Capricorn. The two dim lights would then be feminine ones, the moon, ruler of Cancer, and Venus, ruler of Libra. The opposites between which Astanes stands are thus masculine feminine on the one hand and good, evil on the other. The way he speaks of the four luminaries, he does not know how to save himself from them, suggests that he is subject to Heimarmon, the compulsion of the stars, that is, to a transconscious factor beyond the reach of the human will. Apart from this compulsion, the injurious effect of the four planets is due to the fact that each of them exerts its specific influence on man and makes him a diversity of persons, whereas he should be one. It is presumably Hermes who points out to Ostanes that something incorruptible is in his nature, which he shares with the Agathodaimon, something divine, obviously the germ of unity. This germ is the gold, the Aurum Philosophorum, the bird of Hermes, or the son of the bird, who is the same as the Phileus Philosophorum. He must be enclosed in the vast Hermeticum and heated until the moistness that still clings to him has departed, i.e., the humidum radical, radical moisture the prima materia, which is the original chaos, and the sea, the unconscious. Some kind of coming to consciousness seems indicated. We know that the synthesis of the four was one of the main preoccupations of alchemy, as was, though to a lesser degree, the synthesis of the seven, metals, for instance. Thus in the same text Hermes says to the sun, I cause to come out to thee the spirits of thy brethren, the planets, O sun, and I make them for thee a crown the like of which was never seen and I cause thee and them to be within me, and I will make thy kingdom vigorous. This refers to the synthesis of the planets or metals with the sun, to form a crown which will be within Hermes. The crown signifies the kingly totality. It stands for unity and is not subject to Hymarmon, 
This reminds us of the seven or twelve rayed crown of light which the Agathodaemon serpent wears on Gnostic gems, and also of the crown of wisdom in the Aurora Consurgens. In the Concilium Coniugi, there is a similar quaternio with the four qualities arranged as combinations of two contraries, cold and moist, which are not friendly to heat and dryness. Other quaternions are, the stone is first an old man, in the end a youth, because the albedo comes at the beginning and the rubido at the end. Similarly, the elements are arranged as two manifesta, water and earth, and two occulta, air and fire. A further quaternio is suggested by the saying of Bernardus Trevisanus, the upper has the nature of the lower, and the ascending has the nature of the descending. The following combination is from the Tractatus Micraris. In it, the Indian Ocean, are images of heaven and earth, of summer, autumn, winter, and spring, male and female. If thou callest this spiritual, what thou doest is probable. If corporeal, thou sayest the truth. If heavenly, thou liest not. If earthly, thou hast well spoken. Here we are dealing with a double quaternio, having the structure shown in the diagram on page 10. The double quaternio, or ogdoad, stands for a totality, for something that is at once heavenly and earthly, spiritual or corporeal, and is found in the Indian Ocean, that is to say in the unconscious. It is without doubt the microcosm, the mystical atom and bisexual original man in his prenatal state, as it were, when he is identical with the unconscious. Hence in Gnosticism the father of all is described not only as masculine and feminine, or neither, but as bythos, the abyss. In the Scolia to the Tractatus Aureus Hermides, there is a quaternio consisting of superius, inferius, exterius, interius. They are united into one thing by means of the circular distillation, named the pelican. Let all be one in one circle or vessel. For this vessel is the true philosophical pelican, nor is any other to be sought after in all the world. The text gives the following diagram. B, C, D, E represent the outside. A is the inside, as it were the origin and source from which the other letters flow, and likewise the final goal to which they flow back. F, G stands for above and below. Together the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G clearly signify the hidden magical septenary. The central point A, the origin and goal, the ocean or great sea, is also called a circulus exiguous very small circle, and a mediator making peace between the enemies or elements that they may love one another in a meet embrace. This little inner circle corresponds to the mercurial fountain in the rosarium, which I have described in my Psychology of the Transference. The text calls it the more spiritual, perfect, and nobler mercurius, the true arcane substance, a spirit, and goes on, for the spirit alone penetrates all things, even the most solid bodies. Thus the Catholicity of religion, or of the true Church, consists not in a visible and bodily gathering together of men, but in the invisible, spiritual concord and harmony of those who believe devoutly and truly in the one Jesus Christ. Whoever attaches himself to a particular Church outside this King of Kings, who alone is the shepherd of the true spiritual Church, is a sectarian, a schismatic, and a heretic. For the Kingdom of God cometh not with observation, but is within us, as our Savior himself says in the 17th chapter of St. Luke. That the Ecclesia Spiritualis is meant is clear from the text. But you will ask, where then are those true Christians who are free from all sectarian contagion? They are neither in Samaria, nor in Jerusalem, nor in Rome, nor in Geneva, nor in Leipzig, but are scattered everywhere through the world, in Turkey, in Persia, Italy, Gaul, Germany, Poland, Bohemia, Moravia, England, America, and even in farthest India. The author continues, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in the spirit and in truth. After these examinations and avowals, I leave it to each man to judge who is of the true church and who not. From this remarkable excursus we learn, first of all, that the center unites the four and the seven into one. The unifying agent is the spirit Mercurius, and this singular spirit then causes the author to confess himself a member of the Ecclesia Spiritualis, for the spirit is God. This religious background is already apparent in the choice of the term pelican for the circular process, since this bird is a well-known allegory of Christ. The idea of Mercurius as a peacemaker, the mediator between the warring elements and producer of unity, probably goes back to Ephesians 2, 13 ff. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near in the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, 
who has made both one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, thereby bringing the hostility to an end. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. In elucidating the alchemical parallel, we should note that the author of the Scolia to the Tractatus Aureus Hermetus prefaces his account of the union of opposites with the following remark. Finally, there will appear in the work that ardently desired blue or cerulean color, which does not darken or dull the eyes of the beholder by the healing power of its brilliance, as when we see the splendor of the outward sun. Rather does it sharpen and strengthen them, nor does he Mercurius slay a man with his glance like the basilisk, but by the shedding of his own blood he calls back those who are near to death and restores to them unimpaired their former life like the pelican. Mercurius is conceived as spiritual blood on the analogy of the blood of Christ. In Ephesians, those who are separated are brought near in the blood of Christ. He makes the two one and has broken down the dividing wall in his flesh. Caro, flesh, is a synonym for the prima materia and hence for Mercurius. The one is a new man. He reconciles the two in one body, an idea which is figuratively represented in alchemy as the two-headed hermaphrodite. The two have one spirit, in alchemy they have one soul. Further, the lapis is frequently compared to Christ as the lapis angularis, cornerstone. As we know, the temple built upon the foundation of the saints inspired in the shepherd of Hermas, a vision of the great building into which human beings, streaming from the four quarters, inserted themselves as living stones, melting into it without seam. The church is built upon the rock that gave Peter his name, Matthew 16, 18. In addition, we learn from the scolia that the circle and the hermetic vessel are one and the same, with the result that the mandala, which we find so often in the drawings of our patients, corresponds to the vessel of transformation. Consequently, the usual quaternary structure of the mandala would coincide with the alchemist's quaternio of opposites. Lastly, there is the interesting statement that an ecclesia spiritualis above all creeds and owing allegiance solely to Christ, the Anthropos, is the real aim of the alchemist's endeavors. Whereas the treatise of Hermes is, comparatively speaking, very old, and in place of the Christian Anthropos mystery contains a peculiar paraphrase of it, or rather, its antique parallel, the scolia cannot be dated earlier than the beginning of the 17th century. The author seems to have been a Paracelsist physician. Mercurius corresponds to the Holy Ghost as well as to the Anthropos. He is, as Gerhard Dorn says, the true hermaphroditic atom and microcosm. Our Mercurius is therefore that same microcosm who contains within him the perfections, virtues, and powers of soul in the dual sense of sun and gold, and who goes through the streets, vicos, and houses of all the planets, and in his regeneration has obtained the power of above and below wherefore he is to be likened to their marriage, as is evident from the white and the red that are conjoined in him. The sages have affirmed in their wisdom that all creatures are to be brought to one united substance. Accordingly, Mercurius, in the crude form of the prima materia, is in very truth the original man disseminated through the physical world, and in his sublimated form he is that reconstituted totality. Altogether, he is very like the Redeemer of the Basilidians, who mounts upward through the planetary spheres, conquering them or robbing them of their power. The remark that he contains the powers of Saul reminds us of the above-mentioned passage in Abul Qasim, where Hermes says that he unites the sun and the planets and causes them to be within him as a crown. This may be the origin of the designation of the lapis as the crown of victory. The power of above and below refers to that ancient authority the tabula smaragdina, which is of Alexandrian origin. 
Besides this, our text contains allusions to the Song of Songs, through the streets and houses of the planets, recalls Song of Songs 3, 2. I will go about the city in the streets, and in the broad ways I will seek him whom my soul loveth. The white and red of Mercurius refers to 5, 10. My beloved is white and ruddy. He is likened to the matrimonium or coniunctio. That is to say, he is this marriage on account of his androgynous form. 3. The Orphan, the Widow, and the Moon In the text cited at the end of the last section, Dorn continues, Hermes Trismegistus called the stone Orphan. Orphan, as the name of a precious stone is found in Albertus Magnus. The stone was called Orphan because of its uniqueness, it was never seen elsewhere, and it was said to be in the Emperor's crown. It was wine-colored and sometimes shone in the night but nowadays it does not shine any more in the darkness. As Albertus Magnus was an authority on alchemy, he may have been the direct source both for Dorn and for Petrus Bonus, CN 66. Orphan, as the name of a gem may therefore mean something like the modern solitaire, a very apt name for the unique Lapis Philosophorum. Apart from Dorn and Petrus Bonus, it seems that this name is found only in the Carmina Heliodori, there it refers to the homeless orphan who is slain at the beginning of the work for purposes of transformation. The terms son of the widow and children of the widow appear to be of Manichaean origin. The Manichaeans themselves were called children of the widow. The orphan referred to by Hermes must therefore have for his counterpart a vidua, widow, as the prima materia. For this there are synonyms such as mater, matrix, venus, regina, femina, virgo, puella pregnans, Virgin in the center of the earth, Luna, Mertrix, Hor, Vetula, Old Woman, more specifically Vetula Extenuata, Enfeebled, Exhausted, Matter Alchemia, who is dropsical in the lower limbs and paralyzed from the knees down, and finally Virago. All these synonyms allude to the virginal or maternal quality of the prima materia, which exists without a man and yet is the matter of all things. Above all, the prima materia is the mother of the lapis, the Filius Philosophorum. Michael Meyer mentions the treatise of an anonymous author, Delphinus, which he dates to some time before 1447. He stresses that this author insisted particularly on the mother-son incest. Meyer even constructs a genealogical tree showing the origin of the seven metals. At the top of the tree is the lapis. Its father is Gabritius, who in turn was born of Isis and Osiris. After the death of Osiris, Isis married their son Gabritius. She is identified with Bea. The widow marries her son. The widow appears here as the classical figure of the mourning Isis. To this event, Meyer devotes a special epithalamium in honor of the nuptials of the mother Bea and her son Gabridius. But this marriage, which was begun with the expression of great joyfulness, ended in the bitterness of mourning, says Meyer, adding the verses. Within the flower itself there grows the gnawing canker, where honey is, there gall, where swelling breast, the chanker. For, when the son sleeps with the mother, she kills him with the stroke of a viper, viperino canatu. This viciousness recalls the murderous role of Isis, who laid the noble worm in the path of the heavenly father, Ra. Isis, however, is also the healer, for she not only cured Ra of the poisoning, but put together the dismembered Osiris. As such, she personifies that arcane substance, be it dew or the aqua permanence which unites the hostile elements into one. This synthesis is described in the myth of Isis, who collected the scattered limbs of his body and bathed them with her tears and laid them in a secret grave beneath the bank of the Nile. The cognomen of Isis was the Black One. Apuleius stresses the blackness of her robe, Pala Nigerima, robe of deepest black, and since ancient times she was reputed to possess the elixir of life as well as being adept in sundry magical arts. She was also called the Old One, or even his daughter. She appears as a teacher of alchemy in the treatise Isis the prophetess to her son Horus. She is mentioned in the role of a whore in Epiphanius, where she is said to have prostituted herself in Tyre. She signifies earth, according to Firmicus Maternus, and was equated with Sophia. She is thousand-named, the vessel and the matter, of good and evil. She is the moon. An inscription invokes her as the one who art all. She is named the Redemptrix. In Athenagoras she is the nature of the aeon, whence all things grew and by which all things are. 
All these statements apply just as well to the prima materia in its feminine aspect. It is the moon, the mother of all things, the vessel. It consists of opposites, has a thousand names, is an old woman and a whore. As matter alchemia, it is wisdom and teaches wisdom. It contains the elixir of life and potentia, and is the mother of the savior and of the filius macrocosmi. It is the earth and the serpent hidden in the earth, the blackness and the dew, and the miraculous water which brings together all that is divided. The water is therefore called mother, my mother who is my enemy, but who also gathers together all my divided and scattered limbs. The Turba says, Sermo Lix, Nevertheless, the philosophers have put to death the woman who slays her husbands, for the body of that woman is full of weapons and poison. Let a grave be dug for that dragon, and let that woman be buried with him, he being chained fast to that woman. And the more he winds and coils himself about her, the more will he be cut to pieces by the female weapons which are fashioned in the body of the woman. And when he sees that he is mingled with the limbs of the woman, he will be certain of death and will be changed wholly into blood. But when the philosophers see him changed into blood, they leave him a few days in the sun until his softness is consumed and the blood dries and they find that poison. What then appears is the hidden wind. The Konyunksho can therefore take more gruesome forms than the relatively harmless one depicted in the Rosarium. It is clear from these parallels that Meyer was fully justified in giving the name Isis to the prima materia or feminine transformative substance. As Karenyi has brilliantly shown, using the example of Medea, there is in that myth a typical combination of various motifs. Love, trickery, cruelty, motherliness, murder of relatives and children, magic, rejuvenation, and gold. This same combination appears in Isis and in the prima materia and forms the core of the drama instigated by the mother world, without which no union seems possible. In Christian tradition, the widow signifies the church. In St. Gregory, the analogy is the story of the widow's cruce of oil, St. Kings 4. St. Augustine says, The whole church is one widow, desolate in this world. She lacketh a husband, lacketh a man, for her bridegroom has not yet come. So too the soul is destitute in the world. But, Augustine continues, Thou art not an orphan, thou art not reckoned as a widow. Thou hast a friend, thou art God's orphan, God's widow. Another tradition to be considered in regard to the widow is the Kabbalah. There the abandoned Malchuth is the widow, as Nor von Rosenroth says, Almana, widow. This is Malchuth, when Tifereth is not with her. Tifereth is the sun and is interpreted by Reuchlin as the microcosm. Malchuth is Domina, the mistress. She is also called Shekinah, the indwelling of God and Virago. The Sephira Tifereth is the king, and in the usual arrangement of the Sephiroth he occupies the second place, Kether Tifereth Yesod Malchuth. Kether, the crown, corresponds to the upward-growing root of the tree of the Sephiroth. Yesod signifies the genital region of the original man, whose head is Kether. Malchuth, conforming to the archetypal pattern, is the underlying feminine principle. In this wicked world ruled by evil, Tifereth is not united with Malchuth. But the coming Messiah will reunite the king with the queen, and this mating will restore to God his original unity. The Kabbalah develops an elaborate Hierosgamos fantasy which expatiates on the union of the soul with the Sephiroth of the worlds of light and darkness. For the desire of the upper world for the God-fearing man is as the loving desire of a man for his wife when he woos her. Conversely, the Shekinah is present in the sexual act. The absconditus sponsus enters into the body of the woman and is joined with the abscondita sponsa. This is true also on the reverse side of the process, so that two spirits are melted together and are interchanged constantly between body and body. In the indistinguishable state which arises it may be said almost that the male is with the female, neither male nor female, at least they are both or either. So is man affirmed to be composed of the world above, which is male, and of the female world below. The same is true of woman. The Kabbalah also speaks of the thalamus, bride chamber, or nuptial canopy beneath which sponsus and sponsa are consecrated, Yesod acting as paranymphus, best man. Directly or indirectly, the Kabbalah was assimilated into alchemy. Relationships must have existed between them at a very early date, though it is difficult to trace them in the sources. Late in the 16th century, we come upon direct quotations from the Zohar, for instance in the treatise 
De Igne et Sale by Blasius Vigineris. One passage in this treatise is of a special interest to us as it concerns the mythologem of the Coniunctio, the Sephiroth, end in Malkuth or the moon, who is the last to descend and the first to ascend from the elemental world. For the moon is the way to heaven, so much so that the Pythagoreans named her the heavenly earth and the earthly heaven or star, because in the elemental world all inferior nature in respect to the heavenly and the heavenly in respect to the intelligible world is, as the Zohar says, feminine and passive, and is as the moon to the sun. In the same measure as the moon withdraws from the sun until she is in opposition to him, so does her light increase in relation to us in this lower world, but diminishes on the side that looks upwards. Contrariwise, in her conjunction, when she is totally darkened for us, she is fully illuminated on that side which faces the sun. This should teach us that the more our intellect descends to the things of sense, the more it is turned away from intelligible things, and the reverse likewise. The identification of Malkuth with Luna forms a link with alchemy, and is another example of the process by which the patristic symbolism of sponsus and sponsa had been assimilated much earlier. At the same time, it is a repetition of the way the originally pagan hieroscamos was absorbed into the figurative language of the church fathers. But Vigenerus adds something that seems to be lacking in patristic allegory, namely the darkening of the other half of the moon during her opposition. When the moon turns upon us her fullest radiance, her other side is in complete darkness. This strict application of the Sol Luna allegory might have been an embarrassment to the church, although the idea of the dying church does take account, to a certain extent, of the transience of all created things. I do not mention this fact in order to criticize the significance of the ecclesiastical Sol Luna allegory. On the contrary, I want to emphasize it, because the moon, standing on the borders of the sublunary world ruled by evil, has a share not only in the world of light, but also in the demonic world of darkness, as our author clearly hints. That is why her changefulness is so significant symbolically. She is duplex and mutable like Mercurius, and is like him a mediator, hence their identification in alchemy. Though Mercurius has a bright side concerning whose spirituality alchemy leaves us in no doubt, he also has a dark side, and its roots go deep. The quotation from Vigenerus bears no little resemblance to a long passage on the phases of the moon in Augustine. Speaking of the unfavorable aspect of the moon, which is her changeability, he paraphrases Ecclesiasticus 27.12 with the words, The wise man remaineth stable as the sun, but a fool is changed as the moon, and poses the question, Who then is that fool who changeth as the moon, but Adam, in whom all have sinned? For Augustine, therefore, the moon is manifestly an ally of corruptible creatures, reflecting their folly and inconstancy. Since, for the men of antiquity and the Middle Ages, comparison with the stars or planets tacitly presupposes astrological causality, the sun causes constancy and wisdom, while the moon is the cause of change and folly, including lunacy. Augustine attaches to his remarks about the moon a moral observation concerning the relationship of man to the spiritual sun, just as Veneris did, who was obviously acquainted with Augustine's epistles. He also mentions Epistola LV 10, the church as Luna, and he connects the moon with the wounding by an arrow. Whence it is said, they have made ready their arrows in the quiver to shoot in the darkness of the moon at the upright of heart. It is clear that Augustine did not understand the wounding as the activity of the new moon herself, but in accordance with the principle omnimalum ab homin, as the result of man's wickedness. All the same, the addition in obscura luna, for which there is no warrant in the original text, shows how much the new moon is involved. This hint of the admitted dangerousness of the moon is confirmed when Augustine, a few sentences later on, cites Psalm 71, 7, In his days justice shall flourish, and abundance of peace, until the moon shall be destroyed. Instead of the strong interficiator, the Vulgate has the milder alpharator, shall be taken away or fail. The violent way in which the moon is removed is explained by the interpretation that immediately follows, that is, the abundance of peace shall grow until it consumes all changefulness of mortality. From this it is evident that the moon's nature expressly partakes of the changefulness of mortality, which is equivalent to death, 
and therefore the text continues. For then the last enemy, death, shall be destroyed, and whatever resists us on account of the weakness of the flesh shall be utterly consumed. Here the destruction of the moon is manifestly equivalent to the destruction of death. The moon and death significantly reveal their affinity. Death came into the world through original sin and the seductiveness of woman, cools moon, and mutability led to corruptibility. To eliminate the moon from creation is therefore as desirable as the elimination of death. This negative assessment of the moon takes full account of her dark side. The dying of the church is also connected with the mystery of the moon's darkness. Augustine's cautious and perhaps not altogether unconscious disguising of the sinister aspect of the moon would be sufficiently explained by his respect for the Ecclesia Luna equation. All the more ruthlessly, therefore, does alchemy insist on the dangerousness of the new moon. Luna is on the one hand the brilliant whiteness of the full moon, on the other hand she is the blackness of the new moon, and especially the blackness of the eclipse when the sun is darkened. Indeed, what she does to the sun comes from her own dark nature. The Concilium Coniugi tells us very clearly what the alchemists thought about Luna. The lion, the lower sun, grows corrupt through the flesh. His flesh is weak because he suffers from quartan fever. Thus is the lion corrupted in his nature through his flesh, which follows the times of the moon and is eclipsed. For the moon is the shadow of the sun, and with corruptible bodies she is consumed, and through her corruption is the lion eclipsed with the help of the moisture of Mercurius. Yet his eclipse is changed to usefulness and to a better nature, and one more perfect than the first. The changefulness of the moon and her ability to grow dark are interpreted as her corruptibility, and this negative quality can even darken the sun. The text continues. During the increase, that is during the fullness of the blackness of the lead, which is our ore, my light is absent, and my splendor is put out. Then comes a passage which may have inspired the picture of the death of the royal pair in the Rosarium, but which is also significant as regards the dark side of the conjunction of Sol and Luna. After this is completed, you will know that you have the substance which penetrates all substances, and the nature which contains nature, and the nature which rejoices in nature. It is named the Tyriac of the philosophers, and it is also called the poisonous serpent, because, like this, it bites off the head of the male in the lustful heat of conception, and giving birth it dies and is divided through the midst. So also the moisture of the moon, when she receives his light, slays the sun, and at the birth of the child of the philosopher she dies likewise, and at death the two parents yield up their souls to the sun and die and pass away, and the parents are the food of the sun. In this psychologum, all the implications of the Sol Luna allegory are carried to their logical conclusion. The demonic quality which is connected with the dark side of the moon, or with her position midway between heaven and the sublunary world, displays its full effect. Sun and moon reveal their antithetical nature, which in the Christian Sol Luna relationship is so obscured as to be unrecognizable, and the two opposites cancel each other out, their impact resulting in accordance with the laws of energetics, in the birth of a third and new thing, a son who resolves the antagonisms of the parents and is himself a united double nature. The unknown author of the Concilium was not conscious of the close connection of his psychologum with the process of transubstantiation, although the last sentence of the text contains clearly enough the motif of Teoqualo, the god-eating of the Aztecs. This motif is also found in ancient Egypt, the pyramid text of Unas, Vath dynasty, says Unas rising as a soul, like a god who liveth upon his fathers and feedeth upon his mothers. It should be noted how alchemy put in the place of the Christian sponsus and sponsa an image of totality that on the one hand was material and on the other was spiritual and corresponded to the paraclete. In addition, there was a certain trend in the direction of an ecclesia spiritualis. The alchemical equivalent of the god-man and the son of god was Mercurius, who as an hermaphrodite contained in himself both the feminine element, sapientia and matter, and the masculine, the Holy Ghost and the devil. There are relations in alchemy with the Holy Ghost movement, which flourished in the 13th and 14th centuries and was chiefly connected with the name of Joachim of Flora, 
1145 to 1202, who expected the imminent coming of the third kingdom, namely that of the Holy Ghost. The alchemists also represented the eclipse as the descent of the sun into the feminine mercurial fountain or as the disappearance of Gabricus in the body of Bea. Again, the sun in the embrace of the new moon is treacherously slain by the snake bite, Canatu Viperino, of the mother beloved, or pierced by the Tellum Passionus, Cupid's arrow. These ideas explain the strange picture in Roisner's Pandora, showing Christ being pierced with a lance by a crowned virgin whose body ends in a serpent's tail. The oldest reference to the mermaid in alchemy is a quotation from Hermes in Olympiodorus, the virginal earth is found in the tail of the virgin. On the analogy of the wounded Christ, Adam is shown in the Codex Ashburnham pierced in the side by an arrow. This motif of wounding is taken up by Honorius of Auten in his commentary on the Song of Songs. Thou hast wounded my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast wounded my heart with one of thy eyes and with one hair of thy neck. The sponsor says one four, I am black but comely. And one five, look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath scorched me. This allusion to the Negretto was not missed by the alchemists, but there is another and more dangerous reference to the bride in 6 4 f. Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Tirza, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. 10. Who is this that looketh forth as the rising dawn, quasi aurora consurgens, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army with banners? The bride is not only lovely and innocent, but witch-like and terrible, like the side of Selene that is related to Hecate. Like her, Luna is all-seeing, an all-knowing eye. Like Hecate, she sends madness, epilepsy, and other sicknesses. Her special field is love magic, and magic in general, in which the new moon, the full moon, and the moon's darkness play a great part. The animals assigned to her, stag, lion, and cock, are also symbols of her male partner in alchemy. As the Chthonic Persephone, her animals, according to Pythagoras, are dogs, i.e., the planets. In alchemy, Luna herself appears as the Armenian bitch. The sinister side of the moon plays a considerable role in classical tradition. The sponsa is the dark new moon. In Christian interpretation, the church and the nuptial embrace, and this union is at the same time a wounding of the sponsus, soul or Christ. Honorius comments on, Thou hast wounded my heart, as follows. By heart is signified love, which is said to be in the heart, and the container is put in the place of the contained. And this metaphor is taken from the lover who loves his beloved exceeding much, so that his heart is wounded with love. So was Christ upon the cross wounded for love of his church. Thou didst first wound my heart when I was scourged for thy love, that I might make thee my sister. Again thou didst wound my heart with one of thine eyes when, hanging upon the cross, I was wounded for love of thee, that I might make thee my bride to share my glory. The moment of the eclipse and mystic marriage is death on the cross. In the Middle Ages the cross was therefore logically understood as the mother. Thus in the Middle English dispute between Mary and the cross, the cross is a false tree that destroyed Mary's fruit with a deadly drink. She laments, my Sony stepmother I they call. Sancta Crux replies, Lady, to thee I owe honor. The fruit me flourisheth in blood color. The motif of wounding in alchemy goes back to Zosimos, third cent, and his visions of a sacrificial drama. The motif does not occur in such complete form again. One next meets it in the turba. The dew is joined to him who is wounded and given over to death. The dew comes from the moon, and he who is wounded is the sun. In the treatise of Philolitha, in Troitus of Perdus at Occlusum Regis Palladium, the wounding is caused by the bite of the rabid Coracine dog, in consequence of which the hermaphrodite child suffered from hydrophobia. Dorn, in his De Tenebris Contra Naturam, associates the motif of wounding and the poisonous snake bite with Genesis 3, for the sickness introduced into nature by the serpent and the deadly wound she inflicted, a remedy is to be sought. Accordingly, it is the task of alchemy to root out the original sin and this is accomplished with the aid of the balsamum vitae, balsam of life, which is a true mixture of the natural heat with its radical moisture. The life of the world is the light of nature and the celestial sulfur, whose substance is the etheric moisture and heat of the firmament, like to the sun and moon. 
The conjunction of the moist equal moon and the hot sun thus produces the balsam, which is the original and incorrupt life of the world. Genesis 3, 15, He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel, RSV, was generally taken as a prefiguration of the Redeemer. But since Christ was free from the stain of sin, the wiles of the serpent could not touch him, though of course mankind was poisoned. Whereas the Christian belief is that man is freed from sin by the redemptory act of Christ, the alchemist was evidently of the opinion that the restitution to the likeness of original and incorrupt nature had still to be accomplished by the art, and this can only mean that Christ's work of redemption was regarded as incomplete. In view of the wickednesses which the prince of this world, undeterred, goes on perpetrating as liberally as before, one cannot withhold all sympathy from such an opinion. For an alchemist who professed allegiance to the Ecclesia Spiritualis, it was naturally of supreme importance to make himself an unspotted vessel of the paraclete, and thus to realize the idea of Christ on a plane far transcending a mere imitation of him. It is tragic to see how this tremendous thought got bogged down again and again in the welter of human folly. A shattering example of this is afforded not only by the history of the Church, but above all by alchemy, itself, which richly merited its own condemnation, in ironical fulfillment of the dictum, in Sterquilinius Inventor, it is found in cesspools. Agrippa von Nettesheim was not far wrong when he opined that chymists are of all men the most perverse. In his Mysterium Luna, an extremely valuable study for the history of alchemical symbolism, Rahner mentions that the waxing and waning of the bride, Luna, Ecclesia, is based on the kenosis of the bridegroom in accordance with the words of St. Ambrose, Luna is diminished that she may fill the elements. Therefore is this a great mystery. To her it was given by him who confers grace upon all things. He emptied her that he might fill her, as he also emptied himself that he might fill all things. He emptied himself that he might come down to us. He came down to us that he might rise again for all. Thus has Luna proclaimed the mystery of Christ. Thus the changefulness of the moon is paralleled by the transformation of the pre-existent Christ from a divine into a human figure through the emptying, that passage in Philippians 6, which has aroused so much comment, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be clung to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. RSV DV even the most tortuous explanations of theology have never improved on the lapidary paradox of St. Hilary. Deus homo, immortalis mortuus, eternus sepultus, God-man, immortal dead, eternal buried. According to Ephraim Cyrus, the kenosis had the reverse effect of unburdening creation. Because the creatures were weary of bearing the prefigurations of his glory, he disburdened them of those prefigurations, even as he had disburdened the womb that bore him. Ambrose's reference to the kenosis makes the changing of the moon causally dependent on the transformation of the bridegroom. The darkening of Luna then depends on the sponsus, soul, and here the alchemists could refer to the darkening of the beloved's countenance in Song of Songs 1, 4-5. The sun, too, is equipped with darts and arrows. Indeed, the secret poisoning that otherwise emanates from the coldness and moisture of the moon is occasionally attributed to the cold dragon, who contains a volatile, fiery spirit, and spits flames. Thus in emblem L of the Scrutinium he is given a masculine role. He wraps the woman in the grave in a deadly embrace. The same thought occurs again in emblem V, where a toad is laid on the breast of the woman so that she, suckling it, may die as it grows. The toad is a cold and damp animal like the dragon. It empties the woman as though the moon were pouring herself into the sun. Four, alchemy and Manichaeism. At the beginning of the last section, I mentioned the term orphan for the lapis. Here the motif of the unknown or absent father seems to be of special importance. Mani is the best known example of the son of the widow. His original name was said to be Kubricus. Later he changed it to Manes, a Babylonian word meaning vessel. As a four-year-old boy, he was sold as a slave to a rich widow. She came to love him and later adopted him and made him her heir. Together with her wealth, he inherited the serpent's poison of his doctrine, 
the four books of Scythianos, the original master of his adoptive father Terebinthos, named Buddha. Of this Scythianos, there is a legendary biography which equates him with Simon Magus. Like him, he is said to have come to Jerusalem at the time of the apostles. He propounded a dualistic doctrine which, according to Epiphanius, was concerned with pairs of opposites, white and black, yellow and green, moist and dry, heaven and earth, night and day, soul and body, good and evil, right and wrong. From these books, Mani concocted his pernicious heresy which poisoned the nations. Kubricus is, is very like the alchemical Kibrius, Gabricus, Kibrich, Kibric, Kibric, Kybrig, Kibric, Alkibric, Kibrith, Gabricius, Gabrius, Thebridius, Thebridus, and so on. The Arabic word Kibrit means sulfur. In the Aurora Consurgens, sulfur nigrum stands side by side with Vetula, the first being a synonym for spirit and the second for soul. Together they form a pair roughly comparable to the devil and his grandmother. This relationship also occurs in Rosencroats's chemical wedding, where a black king sits beside a veiled old woman. The black sulfur is a pejorative name for the active masculine substance of Mercurius and points to its dark Saturnine nature, which is evil. This is the wicked Moorish king of the chemical wedding who makes the king's daughter his concubine, Miratrix, the Ethiopian of other treatises, analogous to the Egyptian in the Passio Perpetuae, who from the Christian point of view is the devil. He is the activated darkness of matter, the umbra solis, shadow of the sun, which represents the virginal maternal prima materia. When the doctrine of the incretum began to play a role in alchemy during the 16th century, it gave rise to a dualism which might be compared with the Manichaean teaching. In the Manichaean system, matter, highly, is personified by the dark, fluid human body of the evil principle. As St. Augustine says, the substance of evil had its own hideous and formless bulk, either gross, which they called earth, or thin and tenuous like the air, for they imagine it to be some malignant mind creeping over the earth. The Manichaean doctrine of the Anthropos shares the dual form of its Christ figure with alchemy, insofar as the latter also has a dualistic redeemer, Christ as savior of man, microcosm, and the Lapis Philosophorum as savior of the macrocosm. The doctrine presupposes on the one hand a Christ incapable of suffering, impatibilis, who takes care of souls, and on the other hand a Christ capable of suffering, patibilis, whose role is something like that of a spiritus vegetivus, or of Mercurius. This spirit is imprisoned in the body of the princes of darkness and is freed as follows by angelic beings who dwell in the sun and moon. Assuming alternately male and female form, they excite the desires of the wicked, and cause them to break out in a sweat of fear which falls upon the earth and fertilizes the vegetation. In this manner, the heavenly light material is freed from the dark bodies and passes into plant form. The inflammation by desire has its analogy in the alchemist's gradual warming of the substances that contain the arcanum. Here, the symbol of the sweat bath plays an important role, as the illustrations show. Just as for the Manichaeans, the sweat of the archons signified rain, so for the alchemists, sweat meant dew. In this connection, we should also mention the strange legend reported in the Acta Archelae concerning the apparatus which the Son of the Living Father invented to save human souls. He constructed a great wheel with twelve buckets which, as they revolved, scooped up the souls from the deep and deposited them on the moonship. In alchemy, the rhoda is the symbol of the opus circulatorium. Like the alchemists, the Manichaeans had a virago, the male virgin Joel, who gave Eve a certain amount of the light substance. The role she plays in regard to the princes of darkness corresponds to that of Mercurius Duplex, who like her sets free the secret hidden in matter, the light above all lights, the Phileus Philosophorum. I would not venture to decide how much in these parallels is to be ascribed directly to Manichaean tradition, how much to indirect influence, and how much to spontaneous revival. Our starting point for these remarks was the designation of the lapis as orphan, which Dorn mentions apparently out of the blue when discussing the union of opposites. The material we have adduced shows what an archetypal drama of death and rebirth lies hidden in the Coniunctio, and what immemorial human emotions clash together in this problem. It is the moral task of alchemy to bring the feminine, maternal background of the masculine psyche, seething with passions, into harmony with the principle of the spirit.
truly a labor of Hercules. In Dorn's words, Learn therefore, O mind, to practice sympathetic love in regard to thine own body, by restraining its vain appetites, that it may be apt with thee in all things. To this end I shall labor, that it may drink with thee from the fountain of strength, and when the two are made one, that ye find peace in their union. Draw nigh, O body, to this fountain, that with thy mind thou mayest drink to satiety, and hereafter thirst no more after vanities. O wondrous efficacy of this fount, which maketh one of two, and peace between enemies. The fount of love can make mind out of spirit and soul, but this maketh one man of mind and body. Chapter 2 The Paradoxa 1. The Arcane Substance and the Point The tremendous role which the opposites and their union play in alchemy helps us to understand why the alchemists were so fond of paradoxes. In order to attain this union, they tried not only to visualize the opposites together, but to express them in the same breath. Characteristically, the paradoxes cluster most thickly round the arcane substance, which was believed to contain the opposites in uncombined form as the prima materia, and to amalgamate them as the lapis philosophorum. Thus the lapis is called on the one hand base, cheap, immature, volatile, and on the other hand precious, perfect, and solid. Or the prima materia is base and noble, or precious and parvi momenti, of little moment. The materia is visible to all eyes, the whole world sees it, touches it, loves it, and yet no one knows it. This stone therefore is no stone, says the turba, that thing is cheap and costly, dark, hidden, and known to everyone, having one name and many names. The stone is thousand-named, like the gods of the mystery religions. The arcane substance is one and all. In the treatise of Comarios, where the philosopher Comarios teaches the philosophy to Cleopatra, it is said, he showed with his hand the unity of the whole. Pelagios asks, Why speak ye of the manifold matter? The substance of natural things is one, and of one nature that which conquers all. Further paradoxes. I am the black of the white, and the red of the white, and the yellow of the red. Or, the principle of the art is the raven, who flies without wings in the blackness of night and in the brightness of day. The stone is cold and moist in its manifest part, and in its hidden part is hot and dry. In lead is the dead life, or burn in water and wash in fire. The Allegoria Sapientum speak of two figures, one of which is white and lacking a shadow, the other red and lacking the redness. A quotation from Socrates runs, Seek the coldness of the moon, and ye shall find the heat of the sun. The opus is said to be a running without running, moving without motion. Make mercury with mercury. The philosophical tree has its roots in the air. This is probably a reference to the tree of the Sephiroth. That paradox and ambivalence are the keynotes of the whole work is shown by the chemical wedding. Over the main portal of the castle, two words are written, Congratular Condoleo. The paradoxical qualities of Mercurius have already been discussed in a separate study. As Mercurius is the principal name for the arcane substance, he deserves mention here as the paradox par excellence. What is said of him is obviously true of the lapis, which is merely another synonym for the thousand-named arcane substance. As the Tractatus Aureus de Lapid says, our matter has as many names as there are things in the world. The arcane substance is also synonymous with the monad and the son of man mentioned in Hippolytus. Monoimos thinks that there is some such man of whom the poet speaks as Oceanus when he says, Oceanus, origin of gods and origin of men. Putting this into other words, he says that the man is all, the source of the universe, unbegotten, incorruptible, everlasting, and that there is a son of the aforesaid man who is begotten and capable of suffering and whose birth is outside time neither willed nor predetermined. This man is a single monad, uncompounded and indivisible, yet compounded and divisible, loving and at peace with all things, yet warring with all things, and at war with itself in all things, unlike and like itself, as it were a musical harmony containing all things, showing forth all things and giving birth to all things. It is its own mother, its own father, the two immortal names. The emblem of the whole man, says Monoimos, is the jot or tittle. This one tittle is the uncompounded, simple, unmixed monad, having its composition from nothing whatsoever, yet composed of many forms, of many parts. 
That single, undivided jot is the many-faced, thousand-eyed and thousand-named jot of the iota. This is the emblem of that perfect and invisible man. The son of the man is the one iota, the one jot flowing from on high, full and filling all things, containing in himself everything that is in the man, the father of the son of the man. The alchemists seem to have visualized their lapis or prima materia in a similar manner. At any rate, they were able to cap the paradoxes of monoemos. Thus they said of Mercurius, This spirit is generated from the substances of the sea and calls himself moist, dry, and fiery, in close agreement with the invocation to Hermes in the magic papyrus entitled The Secret Inscription, where Hermes is addressed as a damp, fiery, cold spirit. The mystery of the smallest written sign, the point, is also known to alchemy. The point is the symbol of a mysterious creative center in nature. The author of the Novum Lumen admonishes his reader, but you, dear reader, you will have above all to consider the point in nature, and you need nothing else but take care lest you seek that point in the vulgar metals where it is not. For these metals, the common gold more especially, are dead. But our metals are alive, they have a spirit, and they are the ones you must take. For know that fire is the life of the metals. The point is identical with the prima materia of the metals, which is a fatty water, aqua pinguis, the latter being a product of the moist and the hot. John D. 1527-1607 speculates as follows. It is not unreasonable to suppose that by the four straight lines which run in opposite directions from a single individual point, the mystery of the four elements is indicated. According to him, the quaternity consists of four straight lines meeting in a right angle. Things and beings have their first origin in the point and the monad. The center of nature is the point originated by God, the sun point in the egg. This, a commentary on the turba says, is the germ of the egg in the yolk. Out of this little point, says Dorn in his Physica Genesis, the wisdom of God made with the creative word the huge machine of the world. The Concilium Coniugii remarks that the point is the chick, Pullus. Milius adds that this is the bird of Hermes, or the spirit, Mercurius. The same author places the soul in the midpoint of the heart, together with the spirit, which he compares with the angel who was infused with the soul at this point, i.e. in the womb. Paracelsus says that the anima iliastri dwells in the fire in the heart. It is incapable of suffering, whereas the Anima cagastris is capable of suffering and is located in the water of the pericardium. Just as earth corresponds to the triangle and water to the line, so fire corresponds to the point. Democritus stresses that fire consists of fiery globules. Light, too, has this round form, hence the designation sun point. This point is on the one hand the world's center, the salt point in the midst of the great fabric of the whole world, as Kunrath calls it, salt equals sapientia. Yet it is not only the bond, but also the destroyer of all destructible things. Hence this world egg is the ancient Saturn, the most secret lead of the sages, and the ambisexual philosophic man of the philosophers, the Catholic androgyny of the sophists, the rebus, etc. The most perfect form is round, because it is modeled on the point. The sun is round, and so is fire, since it is composed of the fiery globules of Democritus. God fashioned the sphere of light round himself. God is an intelligible sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. The point symbolizes light and fire, also the Godhead insofar as light is an image of God or an exemplar of the deity. This spherical light modeled on the point is also the shining or illuminating body that dwells in the heart of man. The light of nature is the radical moisture, humidum radical, which as balsam works from the heart like the sun in the macrocosm, and we must conclude like God in the supra-celestial world. Thus does Steeb describe the, the second God in man. The same author derives the gold from the dew or supra-celestial balsam sinking into the earth. Here he is probably referring to the older formulations of Meyer, where the sun generates the gold in the earth. Hence the gold, as Meyer says, obtains a simplicity approaching that of the circle, symbol of eternity, and the indivisible point. The gold has a circular form. This is the line which runs back upon itself like the snake that with its head bites its own tail, wherein that supreme and eternal painter and potter God may rightly be discerned. The gold is a twice-bisected circle. 
i.e., one divided into four quadrants, and therefore a quaternity, a division made by nature, that contraries may be bound together by contraries. It can therefore, he says, be compared to the sacred city, Jerusalem, cf. Revelation 21, 10 ff. It is a golden castle engirt with a triple wall, a visible image of eternity. Though gold be mute so far as sound or voice is concerned, yet by virtue of its essence it proclaims and everywhere bears witness to God. And just as God is one in essence, so the gold is one homogeneous substance. For Dorn the unity of God, the Unarius, is the center of the Ternarius, the latter corresponding to the circle drawn round the center. The point as the center of the quaternio of the elements is the place where Mercurius digests and perfects. 2. The Scintilla The point is identical with the Scintilla, the little soul spark of Meister Eckhart. We find it already in the teachings of Saturninus. Similarly, Heraclitus, the physicist, is said to have conceived the soul as a spark of stellar essence. Hippolytus says that in the doctrine of the Sethians the darkness held the brightness and the spark of light in thrall, and that this smallest of sparks was finely mingled in the dark waters below. Simon Magus likewise teaches that in semen and milk there is a very small spark which increases and becomes a power boundless and immutable. Alchemy, too, has its doctrine of the scintilla. In the first place, it is the fiery center of the earth, where the four elements project their seed in ceaseless movement. For all things have their origin in this source, and nothing in the whole world is born save from this source. In the center dwells the Archaeus, the servant of nature, whom Paracelsus also calls Vulcan, identifying him with the Attic, the great man. The Archaeus, the creative center of the earth, is hermaphroditic like the Protanthropos, as is clear from the epilogue to the Novum Lumen of Sendivogius. When a man is illuminated by the light of nature, the mist vanishes from his eyes, and without difficulty he may behold the point of our magnet, which corresponds to both centers of the rays, that is, those of the sun and the earth. This cryptic sentence is elucidated by the following example. When you place a twelve-year-old boy side by side with a girl of the same age, and dressed the same, you cannot distinguish between them, but take their clothes off and the difference will become apparent. According to this, the center consists in a conjunction of male and female. This is confirmed in a text by Abraham Eleazar, where the arcane substance laments being in the state of Negredo, through Cham the Egyptian, I must pass. Noah must wash me in the deepest sea, that my blackness may depart. I must be fixed to this black cross, and must be cleansed therefrom with wretchedness and vinegar, and made white, that my heart may shine like a carbuncle, and the old Adam come forth from me again. O Adam Cadman, how beautiful art thou! Like Kedar I am, black henceforth, ah, how long! O come, my Mesek, and disrobe me, that mine inner beauty may be revealed. O Shulamite, afflicted within and without, the watchman of the great city will find thee and wound thee, and rob thee of thy garments, and take away thy veil. Who then will lead me out from Edom, from thy stout wall? Yet shall I be blissful again when I am delivered from the poison wherewith I am accursed, and my inmost seed and first birth comes forth. For its father is the sun, and its mother the moon. It is clear from this text that the hidden thing, the invisible center, is Adam Cadmon, the original man of Jewish Gnosis. It is he who laments in the prisons of the darkness and who is personified by the black Shulamite of the Song of Songs. He is the product of the conjunction of sun and moon. The scintillae often appear as golden and silver and are found in multiple form in the earth. They are then called oculi piscium, fish's eyes. The fish's eyes are frequently mentioned by the authors, probably first by Morianus Romanus and in the Tractatus Aristotelis and then by many later ones. In Manjet there is a symbol ascribed to the philosopher Malice, which shows eyes in the stars, in the clouds, in the water, and in the earth. The caption says, This stone is under you, and near you, and above you, and around you. The eyes indicate that the lapis is in the process of evolution and grows from these ubiquitous eyes. Ripley remarks that at the desiccation of the sea, a substance is left over that shines like a fish's eye. According to Dorn, this shining eye is the sun, which plunges the center of its eye into the heart of man, as if it were the secret of warmth and illumination. 
The fish's eye is always open, like the eye of God. Something of the sort must have been in the mind of the alchemists, as is evidenced by the fact that Irenaeus Orandus used as a motto for his edition of Nicholas Flamel, the words of Zechariah 4.10, And they shall rejoice and see the plummet, Lapidem Stanium, in the hand of Zorobabel. These are the seven eyes of the Lord that run to and fro through the whole earth. 3.9 is also relevant. Upon one stone there are seven eyes, D.V., Firmicus Maternus may be referring to the latter passage when he says, The sign of one profane sacrament is God from the rock. The other is the stone which God promised to send to strengthen the foundations of the promised Jerusalem. Christ is signified to us by the venerable stone. Just as the one stone meant for the alchemists the lapis, so the fish's eyes meant the seven eyes or the one eye of God, which is the sun. The Egyptians held that the eye is the seat of the soul. For example, Osiris is hidden in the eye of Horus. In alchemy, the eye is the colum, heaven. It is like an eye and a seeing of the soul, whereby the state of the soul and her intentions are oft-times made known to us, and through the rays and the glance of heaven, all things take form. In Steve's view, which agrees with that of Marsilius Ficinus, the colum is a virtus, indeed a certain perfect living being. Hence the alchemists called their quinta essentia colum, the idea of a virtus is borne out by the description of the Holy Ghost as an eye, a parallel to the invocation to Hermes, Hermes, the eye of heaven. The eye of God emits power and light. Likewise, the fish's eyes are tiny soul sparks from which the shining figure of the Phileus is put together. They correspond to the particles of light imprisoned in the dark physis, whose reconstitution was one of the chief aims of Gnosticism and Manichaeism. There is a similar nexus of ideas in the Siddhashila of Jainism. The loka world is held in the middle of the aloka void, in the form of the trunk of a man, with Siddhashila at the top, the place where the head should be. This Siddhashila is the abode of the omniscient souls, and may be called the spiritual eye of the, the universe. The eye, like the sun, is a symbol as well as an allegory of consciousness. In alchemy the scintillulae are put together to form the gold, soul, in the Gnostic systems, the atoms of light are reintegrated. Psychologically, this doctrine testifies to the personality or ego character of psychic complexes. Just as the distinguishing mark of the ego complex is consciousness, so it is possible that other unconscious complexes may possess, as splinter psyches, a certain luminosity of their own. From these atoms is produced the monad and the lapis in its various significations, in agreement with the teachings of Epicurus, who held that the concourse of atoms even produced God. In his chapter on knowledge, Dorn uses the concept of the scintillae in moral form. Let every man consider diligently in his heart what has been said above, and thus, little by little, he will come to see with his mental eyes a number of sparks shining day by day, and more and more, and growing into such a great light that thereafter all things needful to him will be made known. This light is the light of nature. As Dorn says in his Philosophia Meditativa, What madness deludes you? For in you, and not proceeding from you, he wills all this to be found, which you seek outside you and not within yourselves. Such is the vice of the common man, to despise everything his own, and always to lust after the strange. The life, the light of men, shineth in us, albeit dimly, and as though in darkness. It is not to be sought as proceeding from us, though it is in us and not of us, but of him to whom it belongeth, who hath deigned to make us his dwelling place. He hath implanted that light in us, that we may see in its light the light of him who dwelleth in light inaccessible, and that we may excel his other creatures. In this especially we are made like unto him, that he hath given us a spark of his light. Thus the truth is to be sought not in ourselves, but in the image of God which is within us. In Dorn's view, there is in man an invisible sun, which he identifies with the Archeus. This sun is identical with the sun in the earth, in agreement with the passage from Novum Lumen, Supra Par. The invisible sun enkindles an elemental fire which consumes man's substance and reduces his body to the prima materia. It is also compared with salt or natural balsam, which has in itself corruption and protection against corruption. This paradoxical aspect is borne out by a curious saying, Man is the bait wherein the sparks struck by the flint, i.e. Mercurius, 
and by the steel, i.e. heaven, seize upon the tinder and show their power. Mercurius as the flint is evidently thought of here in his feminine, thonic form, and heaven stands for his masculine, spiritual quintessence. From the nuptial impact between the two, the spark is struck, the archeus, which is a corrupter of the body, just as the chemist is a corrupter of metals. This negative aspect of the scintilla is remarkable, but it agrees very well with the alchemist's less optimistic medico-scientific view of the world. For them, the dark side of the world and of life had not been conquered, and this was the task they set themselves in their work. In their eyes, the fire point, the divine center in man, was something dangerous, a powerful poison which required very careful handling if it was to be changed into the panacea. The process of individuation, likewise, has its own specific dangers. Dorn expresses the standpoint of the alchemists in his fine saying, there is nothing in nature that does not contain as much evil as good. In Kunrath, the scintilla is the same as the elixir. Now the elixir is well and truly called a shining splendor or perfect scintilla of him who alone is the mighty and strong. It is the true aqua permanens, eternally living. The radical moisture is animated by a fiery spark of the world's soul, for the spirit of the Lord filleth the whole world. He also speaks of a plurality of sparks. There are fiery sparks of the world's soul, that is of the light of nature, dispersed or scattered at God's command, in and through the fabric of the great world, into all fruits of the elements everywhere. The scintilla is associated with the doctrine of the Anthropos. The sun of the great world is filled, animated, and impregnated with a fiery spark of Ruach Elohim, the spirit, breath, wind, or blowing of the triune God from the body, spirit, and soul of the world, or sulfur and salt, mercury, and the universal fiery spark of the light of nature. The fiery sparks of the world soul were already in the chaos, the prima materia, at the beginning of the world. Kunrath rises to Gnostic heights when he exclaims, and our Catholic Mercury, by virtue of his universal fiery spark of the light of nature, is beyond doubt Proteus, the sea god of the ancient pagan sages, who hath the key to the sea and power over all things, son of Oceanos and Tethys. Many centuries lie between Monoemos and Kunrath. The teachings of Monoemos were completely unknown in the Middle Ages, and yet Kunrath hit upon very similar thoughts, which can hardly be ascribed to tradition. 3. The Enigma of Bologna These paradoxes culminate in an allegedly ancient monument, an epitaph said to have been found in Bologna, known as the Aelia Lelia Crispis inscription. It was appropriated by the alchemists, who claimed, in the words of Michael Meyer, that it was set up by an artificer of old to the honor of God and in praise of the chemic art. I will first give the text of this highly remarkable inscription. Alia Lalia Crispis, nec mulier, nec androgyna, nec puella, nec juvenis, nec anus, nec casta, nec meretrix, nec pudica, sed omnia. Alia Lalia Crispis, neither man nor woman, nor mongrel, nor maid, nor boy, nor crone, nor chaste, nor whore, nor virtuous, but all. Sublata nec fame, nec ferro, nec venino, sed omnibus. Nec coilo, nec aquis, nec terris, sed ubiqui asset. Carried away neither by hunger, nor by sword, nor by poison, but by all. Neither in heaven, nor in earth, nor in water, but everywhere is her resting place. Lucius Agatho Priscius, nec meritus, nec amateur, nec necessarius, neque morens, neque gaudens, neque flens, hank neque molum, nec pyramidum, nec sepulchrum, sed omnia. Lucius Agatho Priscius, neither husband, nor lover, nor kinsman, neither mourning, nor rejoicing, nor weeping, raised up, neither mound, nor pyramid, nor tomb, but all. Sit at neshet, qui posuerit, he knows and knows not what he raised up to whom. Hoc est sepulchrum, intus cadaver non habens. This is a tomb that has no body in it. Hoc est cadaver, sepulchrum extra non habens. This is a body that has no tomb round it. Said cadaver item est et sepulchrum sibi. But body and tomb are the same. Let it be said at once, this epitaph is sheer nonsense, a joke, but one that for centuries brilliantly fulfilled its function as a flypaper for every conceivable projection that buzzed in the human mind. It gave rise to a cause celebre, a regular psychological affair, that lasted for the greater part of two centuries and produced a spate of commentaries, finally coming to an inglorious end as one of the spurious texts of the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum, and thereafter passing into oblivion.
The reason why I'm digging up this curiosity again in the 20th century is that it serves as a paradigm for that peculiar attitude of mind which made it possible for the men of the Middle Ages to write hundreds of treatises about something that did not exist and was therefore completely unknowable. The interesting thing is not this futile stalking horse, but the projections it aroused. There is revealed in them an extraordinary propensity to come out with the wildest fantasies and speculations, a psychic condition which is met with today in a correspondingly erudite milieu, only as an isolated pathological phenomenon. In such cases, one always finds that the unconscious is under some kind of pressure and is charged with highly effective contents. Sometimes a differential diagnosis as between tomfoolery and creativity is difficult to make, and it happens again and again that the two are confused. Such phenomena, whether historical or individual, cannot be explained by causality alone, but must also be considered from the point of view of what happened afterwards. Everything psychic is pregnant with the future. The 16th and 17th centuries were a time of transition from a world founded on metaphysics to an era of immanentist explanatory principles, the motto no longer being omne animal a deo, but omna vivum ex ovo. What was then brewing in the unconscious came to fruition in the tremendous development of the natural sciences, whose youngest sister is empirical psychology. Everything that was naively presumed to be a knowledge of transcendental and divine things which human beings can never know with certainty, and everything that seemed to be irretrievably lost with the decline of the Middle Ages, rose up again with the discovery of the psyche. This premonition of future discoveries in the psychic sphere expressed itself in the phantasmagoric speculations of philosophers who until then had appeared to be the arch peddlers of sterile verbiage. However nonsensical and insipid the alia lalia epitaph may look, it becomes significant when we regard it as a question which no less than two centuries have asked themselves. What is it that you do not understand and can only be expressed in unfathomable paradoxes? Naturally, I do not lay this question at the door of that unknown humorist who perpetrated this practical joke. It existed long before him in alchemy, nor would he ever have dreamt that his joke would become a cause célèbre or that it would lead his contemporaries and successors to question the nature of the psychic background a question which, in the distant future, was to replace the certainties of revealed truth. He was only a causa instrumentalis, and his victims, as naive and innocent as himself, made their first involuntary steps as psychologists. It seems that the first report of the Alia Lalia inscription appeared in the treatise of a certain Marius L. Michael Angelus of Venice in the year 1548 and as early as 1683, Caesar Malvasius had collected no less than 45 attempts at interpretation. In alchemical literature, the treatise of the physician Nicholas Barnard of Crest, Dauphiné, who lived in the second half of the 16th century, has been preserved. He gave an alchemical interpretation of the inscription in, it appears, 1597. To begin with, I shall keep to his interpretation and that of the learned Michael Meyer, Meyer maintains that Aelia and Lelia represent two persons who are united in a single subject, named Crispus. Barnau calls Aelia solar, presumably a derivation from sun. Lelia he interprets as lunar. Crispus, curly-haired, thinks Meyer, comes from the curly hairs which are converted into a very fine powder. Meyer obviously has in mind the tincture, the arcane substance. Barnau, on the other hand, says that our materia is obvoluta, intricata, therefore curly. These two persons, says Meyer, are neither man nor woman, but they once were. Similarly, the subject was in the beginning an hermaphrodite, but no longer is so, because though the arcane substance is composed of sponsus and sponsa, and is thus as it were bisexual, as a third thing it is new and unique, neither is the subject a maid or virgin, because she would be intact. In the opus, however, the virgin is called a mother, although she has remained a virgin. Nor is the subject a boy, because the consummation of the coniunctio contradicts this, nor a crone, because it still retains its full strength, nor a whore, because it has nothing to do with money, nor is it virtuous, because the virgin has cohabited with a man. The subject, he says, is a man and a woman, because they have completed the conjugal act, and an hermaphrodite, because two bodies are united in one. 
It is a girl because it is not yet old, and a youth because it is in full possession of its powers. It is an old woman because it outlasts all time, i.e. is incorruptible. It is a whore because Bea prostituted herself to Gabridius before marriage. It is virtuous because the subsequent marriage gave absolution. But all is the real explanation of the enigma. All these designations refer to qualities of the one thing, and these were thought of as existing, but they are not entities in themselves. The same is true of the carried away passage. The substance, Euroboros, devours itself and thus suffers no hunger. It does not die by the sword, but slays itself with its own dart, like the scorpion, which is another synonym for the arcane substance. It is not killed by poison because, as Barnaud says, it is a good poison, a panacea with which it brings itself to life again. At the same time, it is killed by all three, by hunger for itself, by the sword of Mercurius, and by its own poison as snake or scorpion. By all again points to the arcane substance, as Barnau says, this is everything, it has within itself everything needful for its completion, everything can be predicated of it, and it of everything. For the one is the whole, as the greatest chymist saith, because of the one, everything is, and if the whole had not the whole in itself, the whole would not be. That the arcanum is neither in heaven, nor on earth, nor in water, is explained by Meyer as a reference to the lapis, which is found everywhere. It is found in all the elements, and not only in one of them. Here Barnau is rather more subtle, for he equates heaven with the soul, earth with the body, and water with the spirit, and thus arrives at the idea of the wholeness of a living organism. Our material, he says, is simultaneously in heaven, on earth, and in the water, as if holy in the whole and holy in each part, so that those parts, though otherwise divisible, can no longer be separated from one another after they are made one. The whole law and prophets of alchemy seem to depend upon this. Barnaud explains the name of him who raised the tomb, Lucius Agatho Priscius, as follows. Lucius is lucid, endowed with the most lucid intellect. Agatho is good-natured, G.K. good, upright. Priscius is Priscus, pristine, senior, of ancient time, reckoned among those upright philosophers of old. Mayer maintains that these names signified the chief requisite necessary for the fulfillment of the art neither husband nor lover, etc., means that Aelia Lelia drew him to herself as the magnet the iron and changed him into her nebulous and black nature. In the Coniuncio he became her husband and was necessary to the work, but Meyer does not tell us to what extent he was not the husband, etc. Barnau says these are the chief causes, namely marriage, love, and consanguinity, which move a man to raise a column to the dead in the temple of memory, and none of these can here be considered. Lucius had another purpose in mind. He wished the art, which teaches everything, which is of all things the most precious, and is concealed under this enigma, to appear upon the scene, so that the investigators might apply themselves to the art and true science, which surpasses all else in worth. True, he makes an exception of that holiest investigation agnitionum of God and Christ, whereon our salvation depends a proviso we often meet in the texts. Meyer ignores the negative in neither mourning, etc., just as he did in neither husband. In truth, he says, all this can as well be said positively of Lucius and not negatively. On the other hand, Barnau remarks that it draws a picture of an intrepid philosopher, smooth and rounded. Neither mound, etc., is again explained positively by Meyer. Aelia is herself the mound, which endures as something firm and immovable. This is a reference to the incorruptibility which the opus sought to achieve. He says the pyramid signifies a flame to eternal remembrance, and this was Aelia herself. She was buried because Lucius did everything he had to do in her name. He takes her place, as it were, just as the Phileus Philosophorum takes the place of the maternal prima materia, which till then had been the only effective arcane substance. Barnau declares that though Lucius is a building, it does not fulfill its purpose since it is a symbol. But all, he refers to the tabula smaragdina, because the epitaph as a whole points to the medicina summa et catholica. By he knows and knows not, Meyer thinks that Lucius knew it at first, but no longer knew it afterwards, because he himself was ungratefully forgotten. It is not clear to me what this is intended to mean. Barnau takes the monument as an allegory of the lapis, of which Lucius knew. 
He explains the quid as quantum, for Lucius probably did not know how much the stone weighed. Neither, of course, did he know for what future discoverer he had made the inscription. Barnau's explanation of quid is decidedly feeble. It would be more to the point to remember that the lapis is a fabulous entity of cosmic dimensions which surpasses human understanding. Consideration for the prestige of the alchemist may have prevented him from indulging this suggestive thought, for as an alchemist he could not very well admit that the artifacts himself did not know what he was producing with his art. Had he been a modern psychologist, he might have realized with a little effort that man's totality, the self, is by definition beyond the bounds of knowledge. With this is a tomb, etc., we reach the first positive statement bearing the names of the inscription. Mayer's opinion is that this has nothing to do with the tomb, which was no tomb, but that Alia herself is meant. For she herself is the container, converting into herself the contained, and thus she is a tomb or receptacle that has no body or content in it, as was said of Lot's wife, who was her own tomb without a body and a body without a tomb. He is evidently alluding to the second version of the Erislius vision, which says, With so much love did Bea embrace Gabricus that she absorbed him wholly into her own nature and dissolved him into indivisible particles. Ripley says that at the death of the king all his limbs were torn into atoms. This is the motif of dismemberment which is well known in alchemy. The atoms are, or become, white sparks, shining in the terra foetida. They are also called the fish's eyes. The explanation of Aelia herself as the tomb would naturally appeal to an alchemist, as this motif plays a considerable role in the literature. He called his vessel a tomb, or, as in the Rosarium, a red tumulus of rock. The Turba says that a tomb must be dug for the dragon and the woman. Innerment is identical with the Nigretto. A Greek treatise describes the alchemical process as the eight graves. Alexander found the tomb of Hermes when he discovered the secret of the art. The king is buried in Saturn, an analogy of the buried Osiris. While the negredo of the burial endures, the woman rules, referring to the eclipse of the sun or the conjunction with the new moon. Thus, concludes Meyer, tomb and body are the same. Barnard says, bury, they say, each thing in the grave of the other. For when sulfur, sol, and aqua, or sol, luna, and mercurius are in our material, they must be extracted, conjoined, buried, and mortified, and turned into ashes. Thus it comes to pass that the nest of the birds becomes their grave, and conversely, the birds absorb the nest and unite themselves firmly with it. This comes to pass, I say, that soul, spirit, and body, man and woman, active and passive, in one, the same subject, when placed in the vessel, heated with their own fire and sustained by the outward magistry of the art, may in due time escape to freedom. In these words the whole secret of the union of opposites is revealed, the summa medicina, which heals not only the body but the spirit. The word escape presupposes a state of imprisonment which is brought to an end by the union of opposites. The Hindus describe this as nirdvandva, free from the opposites, a conception that, in this form at least, is alien to the Christian West because it relativizes the opposites and is intended to mitigate or even heal the irreconcilable conflict in the militant Christian attitude. The interpretation here given of this enigmatic inscription should be taken for what it is, a testament to the alchemical way of thinking, which in this instance reveals more about itself than the epitaph would seem to warrant. But here we must tread carefully, for a good many other explanations are possible and have in fact been given. Above all, we have to consider the genuineness of the monument and its origin. None of the three authors so far mentioned actually saw the inscription. At the time of Malvasius in 1683, there were apparently only two original transcripts of it, one in Bologna, the other in Milan. The one in Bologna ends with the words cui posuerit. The other in Milan adds hoc est sepulchrum, etc., and also a quid to the sit et nesit of the Bologna version. Further, at the head of the Milan version, there is an unelucidated AMPPD in place of the DM, Dius Manibus, at the head of the other. Malvasius states that the monument was destroyed, but he cites eyewitnesses who claim to have seen the inscription and copied it, in particular Joannes Turius of Bruges, who in January 1567 wrote a letter to Richardus Vitus, Richard White of Basingstoke, 
saying that he had read the epitaph with his own eyes in the villa of Marcus Antonius de la Volta at the first milestone outside the Porta Mascarella, Bologna. It was, as the eyewitness and commentator Joannes Casparius Gavardius reports, led into the wall joining the villa to the church. A few of the chiseled letters were worn with time and corroded by a kind of rust, which, he says, testified to its antiquity. Malvasius endeavored to prove its genuineness with the help of numerous other Roman epitaphs and advanced the following theory. The inscription speaks of a daughter who is to be born to Laelius and who is destined for Agatho as a bride. But she is neither daughter nor bride, because though conceived she is not born, and not born, because she miscarried. Therefore Agatho, long chosen as the husband, disappointed in such great hope and betrayed by fate, rightly mocks himself, or pretends to mock himself, with this enigmatic inscription. Malvasius goes out of his way to be fair to the author of the epitaph. He calls Agatho very skilled in this science and that. Indeed, he compares him as being a preeminent worshipper of the exceedingly auspicious number three to Hermes Trismegistus and calls him thrice greatest, an allusion to the concluding sentence of the Tabula Smaragdina. He does this because the inscription is divided into three parts, to which he devotes a long dissertation. Here he gets into difficulties with the four elements and the four qualities, and like all the alchemists, flounders about in his attempts to interpret the axiom of Maria. His idea of a miscarriage likewise comes within the sphere of alchemy, not to mention Gnosticism, for we read in the Tractatus Aristotelis, This serpent is impetuous, seeking the issue death before birth, wishing to lose the fetus and desiring a miscarriage. This refers, of course, to the mercurial serpent or prima materia, which the treatise maintains, strives to pass quickly through the transformation process and to force the light seeds of the anima mundi hidden within it into flower. Of the numerous interpretations made by the commentators, I would like to mention one which seems to me worth rescuing from oblivion. This is the view expressed by the two friends of Malvasius, CN 27, namely that Lucius Agatho was a real person, but that Aelia was a fictitious woman, or perhaps an evil genius in female form, or an ungodly spirit, who in the opinion of one of them flies about in the air, and according to the other dwells in the earth and was enclosed and affixed in a Junonian oak, a sylvan sprite, nymph, or hamadryad, who, when the oak was cut down and burnt, was obliged to seek another dwelling place and so was found, as if dead in this sarcophagus. Thus it was that she was praised, described, and commemorated by the loved and loving Agatho. According to this interpretation, Aelia is Agatho's anima, projected into a Junonian oak. The oak is the tree of Jupiter, but it is also sacred to Juno. In a metaphorical sense, as the feminine carrier of the anima projection, it is Jupiter's spouse and Agatho's beloved. Mythologically, nymphs, dryads, etc. are nature and tree noumena, but psychologically they are anima projections, so far as masculine statements are concerned. This interpretation can be found in the Dendrologia of one of the above-mentioned friends, Ulysses Aldrovandus. I maintain that Aelia Lelia Crispus was one of the Hamadriads, who was tied to an oak in the neighborhood of the city of Bologna, or shut up inside it. She appeared to him both in the tenderest and in the harshest form, and while for some two thousand years she had made a show of inconstant looks like a Proteus, she bedeviled the love of Lucius Agatho Priscius, then a citizen of Bologna, with anxious cares and sorrows, which assuredly were conjured up from chaos, or from what Plato calls Agathonian confusion. One can hardly imagine a better description of the feminine archetype that typifies a man's unconscious than the figure of this most hazardous beloved in Certissima Amasia, who pursues him like a teasing sprite amid the stillness of the groves and springs. It is clear from the text of the inscription that it gives no ground for interpreting Aelia as a wood nymph. Aldrovandus tells us, however, that the Porta Mascarella in Bologna, near which the inscription was alleged to have been found, was called Junonia in Roman times, from which he concludes that Juno was obviously the spiritus loci. In support of his hypothesis that Aelia was a dryad, the learned humanist cites a Roman epitaph that was found in this region, Clodia Plavtila, Sibi ete Gverconio Agathoni, Marito Optimo. This epitaph does in fact occur in the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum, 
but there the operative words are Q. Verconio Agathoni. So Quintus Verconius must suffer his name to be changed to Quirconius to suit the author. Aldrovandus explains the puzzling Hoc est sepulchrum by saying that the oak supplied the necessary building material for the tomb. In substantiation of this, he adds that there was in that locality a village with the name of Casaralta, which he analyzes into casa, house, ara, altar, alta, high. As a further contribution, he quotes an Italian poem about a great oak, representing, he says, the world of the elements, planted as it were in a heavenly garden, where sun and moon are spread out like two flowers. This allusion to the world oak of Pharisides leads us straight to the sun and moon tree of alchemy, to the red and white lily, the red slave and the white woman, or white dove, and the four-hued blossoms of the tree in the western land. Rosner's Pandora portrays the tree as a torch-bearing woman, its top sprouting out of her crowned head. Here the tree is personified by its feminine Newman. Aldrovandus's interpretation is essentially alchemical, as we can see from the treatise of Bernardus Trevisanus, Count of the March and Trevis 1406-90. He tells the parable of a nit adept who finds a clear spring set about with the finest stone and secured to the trunk of an oak tree, the whole surrounded by a wall. This is the king's bath in which he seeks renewal. An old man, Hermes the Mystagogue, explains how the king had this bath built. He placed in it an old oak, cloven in the midst. The fountain was surrounded by a thick wall, and first it was enclosed in hard, bright stone, then in a hollow oak. The point of the parable, evidently, is to bring the oak into connection with the bath. Usually this is the nuptial bath of the royal pair. But here the queen is missing, for it is only the king who is renewed. This unusual version of the motif suggests that the oak, as the feminine Newman, has taken the place of the queen. If this assumption is correct, it is particularly significant that the oak is first said to be cloven and later to be hollow. Now it seems to be the upright trunk or stock of the fountain, now a living tree casting a shadow, now the trough of the fountain. This ambiguity refers to the different aspects of the tree. As the stock, the oak is the source of the fountain, so to speak. As the trough, it is the vessel, and as the protecting tree, it is the mother. From ancient times, the tree was man's birthplace. It is therefore a source of life. The alchemists called both the vessel and the bath the womb, the cloven or hollow trunk bears out this interpretation. The king's bath is itself a matrix, the tree serving as an attribute of the latter. Often, as in the Ripley scroll, the tree stands in the nuptial bath, either as a pillar or directly as a tree in whose branches the Newman appears in the shape of a mermaid equals anima with a snake's tail. The analogy with the tree of knowledge is obvious. The Dodonian oak was the abode of an oracle, the anima here playing the role of prophetess. The snake-like Mercurius appears as a tree Newman in Grimm's fairy tale of The Spirit in the Bottle. The tree has a remarkable relation to the old man in the turba. Take that white tree and build around it a round dark house covered with dew, and place in it a man of great age, a hundred years old, and close the house upon them and make it fast so that no wind or dust can get in. Then leave them for one hundred and eighty days in their house. I say that that old man ceases not to eat of the fruits of that tree until the completion of that number, 80, and that old man becomes a youth. Oh, what wondrous natures which have changed the soul of that old man into a youthful body, and the father is become the son. In this context, we may perhaps cite a rather obscure text from Senior. Likewise, Marcos said, It is time for this child to be born, and he related the following parable. We shall build him a house which is called the grave of Sihoka. He or Maria said, There is an earth near us which is called Tormos, where there are serpents or witches that eat the darkness out of the burning stones, and on these stones they drink the blood of black goats. While they remain in the darkness, they conceive in the baths and give birth in the air, and they stride on the sea, and they inhabit vaults and sepulchres, and the serpent fights with the male and the male continues forty nights in the grave, and forty nights in the little house. The Latin translation serpent, for which, is connected with the widespread primitive idea that the spirits of the dead are snakes. This fits in with the offering of goat's blood, 
since the sacrifice of black animals to the thonic noumena was quite customary. In the Arabic text, the witches refer to the female demons of the desert, the jinn. The grave-haunting Numen is likewise a widespread idea that has lingered on into Christian legend. I have even met it in the dream of a 22-year-old theological student. And I give this dream again so that those of my readers who are familiar with the language of dreams will be able to see the full scope of the problem we are discussing. The dreamer was standing in the presence of a handsome old man dressed entirely in black. He knew it was the white magician. This personage had just addressed him at considerable length, but the dreamer could no longer remember what it was about. He recalled only the closing words, and for this we need the help of the black magician. At that moment the door opened, and in came another old man exactly like the first, except that he was dressed in white. He said to the white magician, I need your advice, but threw a sidelong, questioning glance at the dreamer, whereupon the white magician answered, You can speak freely, he is an innocent. The white-clad black magician then related his story. He had come from a distant land where something extraordinary had happened. The country was ruled by an old king who felt his death near and had therefore sought out a worthy tomb for himself. There were in that land a great number of tombs from ancient times, and the king had chosen the finest for himself. According to legend, it was the tomb of a virgin who had died long ago. The king caused it to be opened, in order to get it ready for use. But when the bones were exposed to the light of day, they suddenly took on life and changed into a black horse, which galloped away into the desert. The black magician had heard this story and immediately set forth in pursuit of the horse. After a journey of many days through the desert, he reached the grasslands on the other side. There he met the horse grazing, and there also he came upon the find on account of which he now needed the advice of the white magician. For he had found the lost keys of paradise, and he did not know what to do with them. Here the dream ended. The tomb was obviously haunted by the spirit of the virgin, who played the part of the king's anima. Like the nymph in Malvasius, she was forced to leave her old dwelling place. Her chthonic and somber nature is shown by her transformation into a black horse, a kind of demon of the desert. We have here the widespread conception of the anima as horsewoman and nightmare, a real, ungodly spirit, and at the same time the well-known fairy tale motif of the aging king whose vitality is at an end. As a sous-entendu, a magical, life-renewing marriage with the nymph seems to be planned, somewhat in the manner of the immortal Merlin's marriage with his fairy. For in paradise, the garden of love with the apple tree, all opposites are united. As Isaiah says, he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. There the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. There white and black come together in kingly marriage, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. 61. 10. The two antithetical magicians are obviously making ready the work of union, and what this must mean for a young theologian can be conceived only as that colossal problem whose solution was considered by the more speculative alchemists to be their chief task. Therefore the senior text continues, He the male will be roused, like the white doves, and his step shall rejoice, and he shall cast his seed upon the marble into the image or spirit that dwells in the marble and the ravens will come flying, and will fall upon it and gather it up. Then they will fly to the tops of the mountains, whither none can climb, and they will become white and multiply. Likewise no man hath known this, unless he himself hath conceived it in his head. This text describes the resurrection after death, and, if we are not deceived, it takes the form of a coniunctio, a coming together of the white dove and the black raven, the latter being the spirit that dwells in the tombstone, CN 219. Since, as often happens, theriomorphic symbols, snakes and doves, are used for the male and female elements, 
This points to the union of unconscious factors, the ravens that gather up the seed or the product of the union, and then fly with it to the tops of the mountains, represent the helpful spirits or familiars who complete the work when the skill of the artifacts has failed him. They are not, as in Faust, beautiful angels, but dark messengers of heaven, who at this point themselves become white. Even in Faust, the angels are not entirely innocent of the arts of seduction, and the angel's inability to sin is, as we know, to be taken so relatively that women have to keep their heads covered in church on account of the moral frailty of these winged messengers, which has more than once proved disastrous in ancient times, e.g. Genesis 6, 2. Similar motifs occur in modern dreams and can be found in persons who have never been remotely concerned with alchemy. For instance, a patient had the following dream. A large pile of wood was burning at the foot of a high wall of rock. The flames shot up with clouds of smoke. It was a lonely and romantic spot. High in the air, a flock of great black birds circled round the fire. From time to time, one of the birds plunged straight into the blaze and was joyfully burnt to death turning white in the process. As the dreamer himself remarked, the dream had a numinous quality, and this is quite understandable in view of its meaning. It repeats the miracle of the phoenix, of transformation and rebirth, the transformation of the negredo into the albedo, of unconsciousness into illumination, as described in the verses from the Rosarium Philosophorum. Two eagles fly up with feathers aflame, naked they fall to earth again yet in full feather they rise up soon. After this digression on transformation and resurrection, let us turn back to the motif of the oak tree, whose discussion was started by the commentators on the enigma. We come across the oak in yet another alchemical treatise, the Introitus Apertus of Philolitha. There he says, Learn then who are the companions of Cadmus, who is the serpent that devoured them, and what the hollow oak to which Cadmus spitted the serpent. In order to clarify this passage, I must go back to the myth of Cadmus, a kinsman of the Pelasgian Hermes Ithophalikos. The hero set out to find his lost sister Europa, whom Zeus had carried away with him after turning himself into a bull. Cadmus, however, received the divine command to give up the search, and instead to follow a cow, with moon markings on both her sides, until she lay down, and there to found the city of Thebes. At the same time he was promised Harmonia, the daughter of Ares and Aphrodite as a wife. When the cow had lain down, he wanted to sacrifice her, and he sent his companions to fetch water. They found it in a grove sacred to Ares, which was guarded by a dragon, the son of Ares. The dragon killed most of the companions, and Cadmus, enraged, slew it and sowed the dragon's teeth. Immediately armed men sprang up, who fell to fighting among themselves until only five remained. Cadmus was then given Harmonia to wife. The spitting of the snake, dragon, to the oak seems to be an addition of Phil of Philolethas. It represents the banishment of the dangerous demon into the oak, a point made not only by the commentary on the Aelia inscription in Malvasius, but by the fairy tale of the spirit in the bottle. The psychological meaning of the myth is clear. Cadmus has lost his sister Anima because she has flown with the supreme deity into the realm of the superhuman and the subhuman, the unconscious. At the divine command, he is not to regress to the incest situation, and for this reason he is promised a wife. His sister Anima, acting as a psychopomp in the shape of a cow, to correspond with the bull of Zeus, leads him to his destiny as a dragon slayer, for the transition from the brother-sister relationship to an exogamous one is not so simple. But when he succeeds in this, he wins Harmonia, who is the dragon's sister. The dragon is obviously disharmony, as the armed men sprung from its teeth prove. These kill one another off as though exemplifying the maxim of pseudo-democritus, nature subdues nature, which is nothing less than the Euroboros conceptually formulated. Cadmus holds fast to Harmonia while the opposites in projected form slaughter one another. This image is a representation of the way in which a split-off conflict behaves. It is its own battleground. By and large, this is also true of yang and yin in classical Chinese philosophy. Hand in hand with this self-contained conflict, there goes an unconsciousness of the moral problem of opposites. Only with Christianity did the metaphysical opposites begin to percolate into man's consciousness, and then in the form of an almost dualistic opposition, 
that reached its zenith in Manichaeism. This heresy forced the church to take an important step, the formulation of the doctrine of the privatio boni, by means of which she established the identity of good and being. Evil as a something that does not exist was laid at man's door, omna bonum adeo, omna malum abhomin. This idea together with that of original sin formed the foundation of a moral consciousness which was a novel development in human history. One half of the polarity, till then essentially metaphysical, was reduced to a psychic factor, which meant that the devil had lost the game if he could not pick on some moral weakness in man. Good, however, remained a metaphysical substance that originated with God and not with man. Original sin had corrupted a creature originally good. As interpreted by dogma, therefore, good is still wholly projected, but evil only partly so, since the passions of men are its main source. Alchemical speculation continued this process of integrating metaphysical projections in so far as it began to dawn on the adept that both opposites were of a psychic nature. They expressed themselves first of all in the duplicity of Mercurius, which, however, was cancelled out in the unity of the stone. The lapis was Deo Concedente, made by the adept, and was recognized as an equivalent of the Homo Totus. This development was extremely important because it was an attempt to integrate opposites that were previously projected. Cadmus is interpreted alchemically as Mercurius in his masculine form, soul. He seeks his feminine counterpart, the Quicksilver, which is his sister, Luna, but she meets him in the shape of the Mercurial Serpent, which he must first kill because it contains the furious conflict of warring elements, the chaos. From this arises the harmony of the elements, and the Koniunksho can now take place. The spoils of the struggle, in this case the dragon's skin, are, according to ancient custom, offered to the hollow oak, the mother, who is the representative of the sacred grove and the fount. In other words, it is offered up to the unconscious as the source of life, which produces harmony out of disharmony. Out of the hostility of the elements there arises the bond of friendship between them, sealed in the stone, and this bond guarantees the indissolubility and incorruptibility of the lapis. This piece of alchemical logic is borne out by the fact that, according to the myth, Cadmus and Harmonia turned to stone, evidently because of an embarrassed erichesse. Perfect harmony is a dead end. In another version they turn into snakes, and even into a basilisk, Dom Pernetti remarks, for the end product of the work, incorporated with its like, acquires the power ascribed to the basilisk, so the philosophers say. For this fanciful author Harmonia is naturally the prima materia, and the marriage of Cadmus, which took place with all the gods assisting, is the coniunctu of Saul and Luna, followed by the production of the tincture or lapis. Pernetti's interpretation of Harmonia would be correct only if she were still allied with the dragon. But since she lost the reptile, she had logically to change herself and her husband into snakes. Thus Malvasius, as well as the more interesting of the commentators, remain within the magic circle of alchemical mythologems. This is not surprising, since hermetic philosophy, in the form it then took, was the only intellectual instrument that could help fill the dark gaps in the continuity of understanding. The Enigma of Bologna and its commentaries are, in fact, a perfect paradigm of the method of alchemy in general. It had exactly the same effect as the unintelligibility of chemical processes. The philosopher stared at the paradoxes of the Alia inscription, just as he stared at the retort, until the archetypal structures of the collective unconscious began to illuminate the darkness. And unless we are completely deluded, the inscription itself seems to be a fantasy sprung from that same paradoxical massa confusa of the collective unconscious. The contradictoriness of the unconscious is resolved by the archetype of the nuptial coniunctio, by which the chaos becomes ordered. Any attempt to determine the nature of the unconscious state runs up against the same difficulties as atomic physics. The very act of observation alters the object observed. Consequently, there is at present no way of objectively determining the real nature of the unconscious. If we are not, as Malvasius was, convinced of the antiquity of the Alia inscription, we must look round in the medieval literature for possible sources or at least analogies. Here the motif of the triple prediction or triple cause of death might put us on the right trail. This motif occurs in the Vita Merlini, 
in the old French romance Merlin, as well as in its later imitations in the Spanish and English literature of the 15th century. But the most important item, it seems to me, is the so-called Epigram of the Hermaphrodite, attributed to Matthieu de Vendôme, Sia 1150. When my pregnant mother bore me in her womb, they said she asked the gods what she would bear. A boy, said Phoebus, a girl, said Mars, neither, said Juno. And when I was born, I was a hermaphrodite. Asked how I was to meet my end, the goddess replied, by arms, Mars, on the cross, Phoebus, by water. All were right. A tree overshadowed the waters. I climbed it. The sword I had with me slipped, and I with it. My foot caught in the branches, my head hung down in the stream. And I, male, female, and neither, suffered by water, weapon, and cross. Another parallel, but dating from late antiquity, is mentioned by Mayer. It is one of the Platonic riddles and runs. A man that was not a man, seeing yet not seeing, in a tree that was not a tree, smote but did not smite, with a stone that was not a stone, a bird that was not a bird, sitting yet not sitting. The solution is, a one-eyed eunuch grazed with a pumice stone, a bat hanging from a bush. This joke was, of course, too obvious to lend itself to alchemical evaluation. Similarly, the epigram of the hermaphrodite was not, so far as I know, taken up by the alchemists, though it might have been a more suitable subject for exegesis. This kind of jest probably underlies the alia inscription. The seriousness with which the alchemists took it, however, is justified not only because there is something serious in every joke, but because paradox is the natural medium for expressing transconscious facts. Hindu philosophy, which likewise struggled to formulate transcendental concepts, often comes very near to the paradoxes so beloved of the alchemists, as the following example shows. I am not a man, neither am I a god, a goblin, a brahmin, a warrior, a merchant, a shudra, nor disciple of a brahmin, nor householder, nor hermit of the forest, nor yet mendicant pilgrim, awakener to myself is my name. Another source that needs seriously considering is mentioned by Richard White of Basingstoke. He maintains that Elia Lelia is Niobe transformed, and he supports this interpretation by referring to an epigram attributed to Agathius Scholasticus, a Byzantine historian. This tomb has no body in it. This body has no tomb round it, but it is itself body and tomb. White, convinced that the monument was genuine, thinks that Agathius wrote his epigram in imitation of it, whereas in fact the epigram must be its predecessor, or at least have derived from the same source on which the unknown author of the Alia inscription drew. Niobe seems to have an anima character for Richard White, for continuing his interpretation, he takes Alia, or Halia, as he calls her, to be the soul, saying with Virgil, fiery is her strength and heavenly her origin. From this Halia takes her name. She was called Lelia, he says, on account of Luna, who exerts a hidden influence on the souls of men. The human soul is androgynous, because a girl has a masculine and a man a feminine soul. To this remarkable psychological insight, he adds another. The soul is also called an old woman, because the spirit of young people is weak. This aptly expresses the psychological fact that, in people with an all-too-youthful attitude of consciousness, the anima is often represented in dreams as an old woman. It is clear that Richard White points even more plainly to the anima in the psychological sense than Aldrovandus. But whereas the latter stressed her mythological aspect, White stresses her philosophical aspect. In his letter of February 1567 to Johannes Turius, he writes that the soul is an idea of such great power that she creates the forms and things themselves. Also, she has within herself the selfness of all mankind. She transcends all individual differences. Thus, if the soul would know herself, she must contemplate herself and gaze into that place where the power of the soul, wisdom, dwells. This is just what happened to the interpreters of the Bolognese inscription. In the darkness of the enigma, the psyche gazed at herself and perceived the wisdom imminent in her structure, the wisdom that is her strength. And he adds, man is nothing other than his soul. It should be noted that he describes this soul quite differently from the way it would be described by a biological or personalistic psychology today. It is devoid of all individual differences. It contains the selfness of all mankind. It even creates the objective world by the power of its wisdom. This description is far better suited, one would think, to the anima mundi than to the anima vagala of the personal man. 
unless he means that enigmatic background of everything psychic, the collective unconscious. White comes to the conclusion that the inscription means nothing less than the soul, the form imprinted on and bound to matter. This, again, is what happened to the interpreters. They formulated the baffling inscription in accordance with the imprint set upon it by the psyche. White's interpretation is not only original, but profoundly psychological. His deserts are certainly not diminished by his having, so it would seem, arrived at his deeper view only after he received Turius's letter of January 1567. Turius was of the opinion that Aelia and Lelia stood for form and matter. He interprets neither in heaven, nor on earth, nor in water, as follows. Since the prima materia is nothing, but is conceived solely by the imagination, it cannot be contained in any of these places. It is not an object of the senses, but is conceived solely by the intellect. Therefore, we cannot know how this material is constituted. It is evident that Turius's interpretation likewise describes the projection of the psyche and its contents, with the result that his secondary explanations are a petitio principii. As is clear from the title of his book, Allegoria Peripatetica Degenerationi, Amicitia et Privationi in Aristotelicum Enigma Elia Lelia Crispis, Fortunius Lycidas reads the whole philosophy of Aristotle into the monument. He mentions the report that it was sculptured in stone, formerly set in a high position on the walls of St. Peter's, but he does not say that he saw it with his own eyes, for in his day it was no longer in existence, if ever it existed at all. He thinks the inscription contains the summation of a serious philosophical theory about the origin of mundane things, a theory that was scientifico moralis or ethico physica. It is the author's intention to combine in a way to be marveled at the attributes of generation, friendship, and privation. That is why, he says, the monument is a true treasure house. After reviewing a number of earlier authors who had devoted themselves to the same theme, Lysatus mentions the work of Joannes Casparius Gavardius, who propounded the theory that the inscription described the nature of love. This author cites the comic poet Alexis in Athenaeus. I think that the painters, or, to put it more concisely, all who make images of this god, are unacquainted with Eros. For he is neither female nor male, again, neither god nor man, neither stupid nor yet wise, but rather composed of elements from everywhere, and bearing many qualities under a single form. For his audacity is that of a man, his timidity a woman's, his folly argues madness, his reasoning good sense, his impetuosity is that of an animal, his persistence that of adamant, his love of honor that of a god. Unfortunately, I was unable to get hold of the original treatise of Gavardius. But there is a later author, Caetanus Felix Varanius, who takes up the Eros theory apparently as his own discovery in his book, Pantheon Argentiae Elocutionis. He mentions a number of earlier commentators, amongst whom Gavardius is conspicuously absent. As Gavardius is named in the earlier lists, it is scarcely likely that Varanius was unacquainted with him. The suspicion of plagiarism is almost unescapable. Varanius defends his thesis with a good deal of skill, though considering the undeniable paradoxicality of Eros, the task he sets himself is not too difficult. I will mention only one of his arguments, concerning the end of the inscription. The inscription ends he says, with sit et neshit qui posuerit, because though the author of this enigmatic inscription knows that he has dedicated it to love, he does not know what love really is, since it is expressed by so many contradictions and riddles. Therefore he knows and does not know know to whom he dedicated it. I mention the interpretation of Varanius mainly because it is the forerunner of a theory which was very popular at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century namely Freud's sexual theory of the unconscious. Varanius even goes so far as to conjecture that Aelia Lelia had a special talent for eroticism, therein anticipating Aldrovandus. He says, Lelia was a whore. Crispis comes from curly-haired, because curly-haired people are frailer than others and more prone to the allurements of love. Here he quotes Marshall, Who's that curly-headed fellow who's always running round with your wife Marianus? Who is that curly-headed fellow? Now it is, as a matter of fact, true that apart from the personal striving for power or superbia, love, in the sense of concupiscentia, is the dynamism that most infallibly brings the unconscious to light. 
and if our author was of the type whose besetting sin is concupiscence, he would never dream that there is any other power in heaven or earth that could be the source of his conflicts and confusions. Accordingly, he will cling to his prejudice as if it were a universal theory, and the more wrong he is, the more fanatically he will be convinced of its truth. But what can love mean to a man with a hunger for power? That is why we always find two main causes of psychic catastrophes. On the one hand, a disappointment in love, and on the other hand, a thwarting of the striving for power. The last interpretation I shall mention is one of the most recent. It dates from 1727, and though its argument is the stupidest, its content is the most significant. How it can be both is explained by the fact that the discovery of significance is not always coupled with intelligence. The spirit bloweth where it listeth. Despite the inadequacy of his equipment, the author, C. Schwartz, managed to get hold of a brilliant idea whose import, however, entirely escaped him. His view was that Lucius Agathopricius meant his monument to be understood as the church. Schwartz therefore regards the inscription as being not of classical but of Christian origin, and in this, as compared with the others, he is undoubtedly right. His arguments, however, are threadbare. To take but one example, he tries to twist DM into Deo Magno. Although his interpretation is not in the least convincing, it nevertheless remains a significant fact that the symbol of the church in part expresses and in part substitutes for all the secrets of the soul which the humanistic philosophers projected into the Elia inscription. In order not to repeat myself, I must refer the reader to what I said about the protective function of the church in psychology and religion. The interpretive projections we have been examining are, with the exception of the last, identical with the psychic contents that dropped out of their dogmatic framework at the time of the Renaissance and the Great Schism, and since then have continued in a state of secularization where they were at the mercy of the immanentist principle of explanation, that is, a naturalistic and personalistic interpretation. The discovery of the collective unconscious did something to alter this situation, for within the limits of psychic experience, the collective unconscious takes the place of the platonic realm of eternal ideas. Instead of these models giving form to created things, the collective unconscious, through its archetypes, provides the a priori condition for the assignment of meaning. In conclusion, I would like to mention one more document that seems relevant to our context, and that is the anecdote about Meister Eckhart's daughter. A daughter came to the Dominican convent asking for Meister Eckhart. The porter said, who shall I tell him? She answered, I do not know. Why do you not know? He inquired. Because, she said, I am neither virgin nor spouse, nor man nor wife, nor widow, nor lady, nor lord, nor wench, nor thrall. The porter went off to Meister Eckhart. Do come out, he said, to the strangest white that ever I heard, and let me come too and put your head out and say, Who is asking for me? He did so. She said to him what she had said to the porter. Quoth he, My child, Thou hast a shrewd and ready tongue. I prithee now thy meaning. And I were a virgin, she replied. I were in my first innocence. Spouse, I were bearing the eternal word within my soul unceasingly. Were I a man, I should grapple with my faults. Wife should be faithful to my husband. Were I a widow, I should be ever yearning for my one and only love. As lady, I should render fearful homage. As wench, I should be living in meek servitude to God and to all creatures. And as thrall, I should be working hard doing my best tamely to serve my master. Of all these things I am no single one, and am the one thing and the other running thither. The master went away and told his pupils, I have been listening to the most perfect person I ween I ever met. This story is more than two hundred years older than the earliest reference to the Aelia inscription, and therefore, if there is any literary influence at all, it could at most be derived from Matthew de Vendôme which seems to me just as unlikely as that Meister Eckhart's vision of the naked boy was derived from the classical poor Eternus. In both cases we are confronted with a significant archetype, in the first that of the divine maiden, anima, in the second that of the divine child, the self. As we know, these primordial images can rise up anywhere at any time quite spontaneously, without the least evidence of any external tradition. This story could just as well have been a visionary rumor as a fantasy of Meister Eckhart or of one of his pupils. 
It is, however, rather too peculiar to have been a real happening. But occasionally reality is quite as archetypal as human fantasy, and sometimes the soul seems to imagine things outside the body where they fall to playing as they do in our dreams.